Okay, colleagues, I propose that we start. Welcome, everybody. Um, first, a uh, household communication. Uh, today, unfortunately, uh, as we are in this meeting room, we cannot have uh, interpretation into and from all languages, so I've been informed there will not be Danish, Finnish, Latvian, Maltese, and Croatian uh, available. We apologize for that, and I hope that you will all manage um, in other languages. Uh, so today we'll have uh, three different sessions in our, in our inquiry. The first session is on U.S. surveillance programs and their impact on uh, EU citizens' privacy and in particular uh, initiatives that are uh, being taken uh, on the other side of the Atlantic uh, as we speak. The second session will be uh, on the role of parliamentary oversight of intelligence services at national level. And the third session will be dedicated to NSA programs for electronic mass surveillance and the role of IT companies. Um, so today we'll start with uh, the session on the U.S. surveillance programs. Uh, and I am really delighted to welcome in our midst uh, Mr. Jim Sensenbrenner to the left of Claude Moraes here, who is a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, a member of the uh, Committee on the Judiciary, and, more importantly for our purpose here today, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security and Investigations, and one of the two um, sponsors, if I may call it that way, of a proposed new act, the U.S. Freedom Act, which is to, um, let's say, set straight in a way, uh, things that have gone, um, have run off track with the, the Patriot Act. Um, the Libe Committee delegation uh, already had a first fruitful uh, meeting with Mr. Sensenbrenner on the 29th of October, and I am particularly pleased that we have an opportunity for an exchange of views here today uh, in Brussels. Uh, for a long time we've been frustrated that we could only meet with our, our colleagues and counterparts uh, in Washington. I think it is very important that transatlantic cooperation takes place not only at the level of governments, but also at the level of uh, elected representatives, uh, such as the members of the... Uh, the U.S. Congress and the European Parliament. Uh, we would call that the, let's say, the parliamentary dimension of transatlantic uh, cooperation. And um, I hope, um, is the NSA fiddling with the lights? <laughs> um, I hope that this, uh, this occasion here today will, uh, will not be a single occasion, but that it will be the start of a regular dialogue and regular cooperation because I think that we, uh, we share um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of topics and it would be useful to continue this and maybe foresee a next meeting uh, in six months or so. Um, so I'm going to invite Congressman Sensenbrenner to, um, to take the floor and introduce the, his proposed U.S. Freedom Act. Uh, which he has introduced together with uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman, Mr. Patrick Leahy, uh, known to some of us uh, as we have met him on previous visits to Washington. Uh, and the U.S. Freedom Act is of particular interest to members of this inquiry committee as it would end the National Security Agency's bulk collection of Americans' communications records by amending the famous or infamous Section 215 of the Patriot Act, uh, and as it makes numerous amendments to the uh, Foreign Intelligence and Surveillance Act, also known as FISA, uh, it would also create a privacy advocate to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the so-called secret court, um, uh, and that privacy advocate could argue civil liberties concerns and appeal court decisions. But we're going to hear more detail uh, from Mr. Sensenbrenner himself. Um, he will introduce the Freedom Act, and after that, as usual, uh, we'll have questions and answers. We'll first take the questions of the, the, the rapporteur and the shadows, and then the other meetings, uh, the other members. I see Mr. Engstrom has a point of order. 
Mr. Pierre uh, also Yes, I, I just got a report from my assistant that the, uh, the web streaming doesn't appear to have any sound, at, le at least not when he's looking at it. So perhaps somebody could look okay, into we'll, that. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll check that. Mr. Pierre, point of order. No, you want the floor afterwards? Okay. Mr. Zippel, point of order? No? Okay. Okay, then Mr. Sensenbrenner, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, and I'd like to thank the European Parliament Civil Liberties Committee for inviting me to testify today. I was the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee when the United States was attacked on 9-11. Congress knew the country needed new tools and broader authorities to combat those who meant to harm us. But we never intended to allow the National Security Agency to peer indiscriminately into the lives of innocent people all over the world. As chairman, I worked under strict time constraints to strike a balance between civil liberties and national security in the USA Patriot Act. The final bill brought together liberal Democrats and far-right Republicans and was passed out of the Judiciary Committee unanimously. I firmly believe that the Patriot Act saved lives by strengthening the ability of intelligence agencies to track and stop potential terrorists. But in the past few years, the NSA has weakened, misconstrued, and ignored the civil liberties protections that we drafted into the law. <clears throat> President Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. After 9-11, with America at risk and poised to enter its most intensive conflict since the Vietnam War, Congress extended the executive branch broader powers to protect the American people, but the NSA has abused that trust. It ignored restrictions painstakingly crafted by lawmakers and assumed a plenary authority we never imagined. Worse, the NSA has cloaked its operations behind such a thick cloud of secrecy that even if the NSA promised reforms, we would lack the ability to verify them. The constant stream of disclosures about U.S. surveillance since June has surprised and appalled me as much as it has the American people and our international allies. I therefore introduced legislation along with Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, that will curtail surveillance abuses and restore trust in the U.S. intelligence community. Our bill is called the Uniting and Strengthening America by Fulfilling Rights and Ending Eavesdropping, Dragnet Collection, Online and Online Monitoring Act, or for short, the USA Freedom Act. The title intentionally echoes the Patriot Act because it does what the Patriot Act was meant to do. It strikes a proper balance between civil liberties and security. The bill has already attracted over 100 bipartisan co-sponsors in Congress and has been endorsed by such li civil liberties groups as the American Civil Liberties Union and the National Rifle Association, which rarely agree on anything. Large technology companies such as Google, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft, and newspaper editorial boards such as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Times. Unlike a competing proposal from our intelligence committees, it will deliver real reforms. The U.S. Congress is engaged in a heated debate over how intelligence is gathered and from whom. On October 31st, on an 11 to 4 vote, the Senate Intelligence Committee, headed by Senator Dianne Feinstein of California, voted for the first time in our country's history to allow unrestrained spying on the American people. I am committed to a different approach. The USA Freedom Act would end the NSA's bulk collection of data under the Patriot Act, whether it pertains to Americans or foreigners. The U.S. government would still be able to follow leads and to obtain data when it has a reasonable suspicion that someone is connected to terrorism, but it no longer would be able to collect data indiscriminately in bulk from innocent people. Other reforms to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and the National Security Letter Statutes would similarly end bulk collection and stop other abuses under the law that the intelligence community has perpetrated against Americans and foreigners alike. Finally, 
as the late U.S. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis wrote, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. In that spirit, the bill greatly enhances reporting, oversight, and transparency to improve accountability at the NSA. As we have seen, the stiffest restrictions can be bent, so transparency and oversight are essential elements of any reform. <coughs> Congress has limited authority to stop the administration from spying on foreign leaders. The surveillance of Chancellor Merkel, for example, was done pursuant to an executive order and not an act of Congress. President Obama said he knew nothing about this intrusion. While I agree that politics should stop at the water's edge, if you will forgive an old Republican partisan quip, there is no better argument for reform than when surveillance abuses occur unbeknownst to the one man authorized to allow them. But even though these abuses were done outside of congressional authority, we should not underestimate the symbolic value of genuine reform. If we succeed, the USA Freedom Act will be the first major initiative since 9-11 to curtail surveillance. It's the strongest message that we can send that innocent people should not be treated as terrorists, that our private lives should be left private, and that the rule of law is neither flexible nor permissive. The USA Freedom Act ensures that the law is properly interpreted. Past abuses are not repeated, and American liberties are protected. Over the coming weeks and months, as more revelations are brought to light and the public outrage grows, Chairman Leahy and I will be working to push this important legislation through the committee process and onto the floors of Congress for a vote. Our liberties are secure only so long as we are prepared to defend them. And that's why I'm calling on the President and my colleagues in Congress to rally around this legislation to protect the shared rights of all Americans and to restore the trust and focus in our intelligence communities. And while I'm talking about trust, let me say that these revelations have really done a lot to hurt the trust that has been built up literally since the end of the Second World War between the United States and Europe. And uh, it is the trust between uh, allies uh, such as our country and the member states of the European Union uh, that can drive the economies of the world and also can stand up for the protection of rights uh, that are inherent in all democratic countries. International cooperation is crucial to stopping terrorism, but trust is also integral. I ask my friends here in the European Parliament to work pragmatically with the United States to continue balanced efforts to protect our nations. Together we can rebuild trust while defending civil liberties and national security on both sides of the Atlantic. Thank you very much for your invitation and I will be happy to spend the rest of the time allotted in answering questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think I hear some. <laughs> Thank you very much, Congressman Sensenbrenner. Um, then we'll open the floor uh, to, for questions and debate. We have until 4 o'clock. That's when the next session starts. <coughs> um, I have, other than the Rapporteur in the Shadows, I have two requests for the floor. Uh, I see two more. That's it. Okay, we close the list uh, for now. Um, I'm going to first invite uh, Mr. Moraz. Um, Let's, let's stick to two minutes each. We have one question, one answer, one question, one answer. Thank you, Congressman Sensenbrenner, for coming today and also uh, for meeting us in Washington, uh, having a key voice um, suggesting that the NSA needs reform is quite important and you've given us uh, some reasons why. Could I now ask you to perhaps go into a little bit more depth about how realistic you think uh, those reforms are going to be both in the United States, uh, but also how you feel um, they will be greeted within the international audience in, in Europe, particularly this issue of um, bulk data collection, how you think 
um, the bill will be received, and if you could go into a little bit more depth on that. Um, and also, um, from the evidence that we have received in this inquiry so far, it's evident that the legal framework and the US constitutional system make it very difficult to extend legal protection on privacy to non-US citizens. So is there going to be cross-party political support for the US Freedom Act uh, to, to strengthen safeguards for EU citizens, given um, the extent of um, uh, press reports saying how that has been undermined and how it undermines transatlantic relations? And if, if I could just ask you one last question on that. The, the EU-US agreements that we have in force are concluded by the executive on the, on the US side. Um, is there any, are there any reflections in Congress uh, to have this as uh, something that Congress should discuss? Well, I'll, I'll, answer that part of, I'll answer that part of your question first. Uh, the separation of powers that is mandated by the United States Constitution gives the President almost plenary authority to conduct foreign affairs. And uh, the Congress has got the power of the purse and the ability to fund what the President uh, uh, suggests or requests. But uh, in terms of actually binding uh, the, the President to a certain course, uh, uh, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to do so because of how the Supreme Court has interpreted the Constitution and the constitutional separation of powers. Now, in terms of protection of EU citizens, what I can say is that uh, effectively uh, the legislation ends bulk data collection. It doesn't say so expressly, uh, but it makes impossible for bulk data collection to occur. And that will be a benefit uh, both uh, here on this side of the Atlantic as well as on our side of the Atlantic. Now, uh, you know, that being said, uh, it's going to require vigorous oversight, and I believe that we're talking about this issue today uh, because there has been a lack of oversight uh, of the NSA by the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the United States government. Uh, I hope that we have learned our lesson on this and that the oversight uh, will be uh, much more vigorous and will be able to bring about changes in NSA policy when the NSA is going uh, beyond the law. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, as there, uh, the shadow of the EPP is not here, unfortunately, I don't know where he is, and I'll put myself at the end of the list, uh, we'll go to Mr. Albrecht of the Greens next. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, first of all, let me thank Mr. Sensenbrenner to come over here. I think it's a very good signal, and for us, it's uh, enabling us to do our work, which we are conducting here to uh, investigate and inquire on uh, the activities, by the way, on both sides of the Atlantic, and uh, we also know uh, that there are quite uh, of red lines crossed also in the European Union's member states and their uh, institutions like the GCHQ and, and the United Kingdom, uh, where I would like to ask you uh, also how you feel about the interconnectivity of, your, uh, of that, because you're talking about the separation with regard to foreign policy, but what we are talking about here seems to be somehow an internal policy issue and widened to external relations. So. Uh, how do you feel about blanket retention, for example, of U.S. American citizens' personal data in the European Union uh, to be conducted? And how do you feel also uh, Europe could uh, uh, get this message of ending up blanket retention? Um, and uh, then, of course, we all would be interested in how the timeline for, for your legislation and for these debates going on in Congress. Thank you. Well, uh, first let me say that... Uh uh, there will not be bulk collection, which means there probably will not be blanket retention. Um, I, I think if we're not talking about the same thing, we're talking about brothers uh, of the same thing. Where there would be an indefinite retention uh, under the Freedom Act would be if somebody was targeted uh, with a reasonable suspicion that they were involved in a terrorist activity. Uh, and I think at that 
point in time, both the intelligence and security and law enforcement uh, uh, agencies of the uh, effective governments, and here I'm talking more about member states than the parliament or the commission, uh, uh, should keep that uh, evidence uh, alive as long as there is an active uh, anti-terrorist investigation against targeted individuals. Uh, uh, one thing that I think we all have to be uh, uh, cognizant of is that whatever is done has got to be constitutional uh, uh, under uh, the United States Constitution on our end uh, and uh, under the constitutions of the various member states of the EU as well as the treaties which uh, have established the European Union and the European Parliament. Uh, and. Uh, if constitutional guarantees are ignored, uh, as I think they have been uh, uh, here with the NSA, uh, that is a sure prescription for trouble. Now, insofar as the timeline is concerned, you know, let me say that uh, neither uh, the White House uh, nor the leadership of the Senate and House of Representatives, and definitely not the intelligence committees uh, of either House, uh, like the bill that uh, Senator Leahy and I have introduced. And uh, uh, the leadership, uh, and meaning Senator Reid in the Senate and Speaker Boehner in the House of Representatives, uh, make the determination on which legislation goes to the floor. Uh, my guess is, is that the time when this fight will take place is when the intelligence committees uh, end up having to present their money bill on the floor and then we will either uh, hope to have the Freedom Act included in the money bill, which I think is not likely at the present time. We will have to try to amend the money bill, and I think we have a better chance of doing that in the House than in the Senate, uh, or the default position would be to defeat the money bill, in which case the other side would be coming rather rapidly to see uh, what needs to be done. Uh, we know what needs to be done, and that's what's in this legislation, which has been painstakingly worked out by Senator Leahy, who is way on the left of the American political spectrum, and myself was way on the right. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Kirkhope and Ms. Ernst are not here, so uh, I'll be the last speaker in the list of shadows, and then we move to the other members who have asked for the floor. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very glad to hear you refer to the left mm -hmm. and the right. Um, I, I think it's always very comfort, comforting to find that we can always come back to those shared democratic values. Um, and I think we also share, you know, across the Atlantic, the interest in, in security. We have to uh, defend ourselves from harm, obviously. But security too often has become a pretext for, um, you know, unlimited... Uh, powers for security services and frankly I fail to see and I think many of my colleagues how for example eavesdropping on the offices of the European Commission could do anything to make the world a safer place or indeed listening to the phone calls of Mrs. Merkel or Mrs. Rousseff unless you suspect them of uh, terrorist intentions obviously um, and security has too often in the past and is still being abused by powers um, for political purposes. And in, in, in this respect, I would say that we probably share a concern for a similar mass surveillance program um, announced by the Russian government called SORM, um, uh, which to me, you know, it's justified again by... Uh, referring to the fight against terrorism and security, but I get the feeling it has a lot more to do with political purposes. Um, a few short questions. Like uh, Claude Moraes, um, I would like to know if you see any opportunity of um, uh, ultimately aligning the, the rights and safeguards for U.S. and non-U.S. Uh, citizens, because I think that would solve many of the problems. Um, and um, if I, I have a few more questions, if you'll just... Uh... Um, I believe that there is going to be a meeting next weekend in Washington where our Commissioner Redding uh, is going to be meeting with U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. Uh, and this is going to be one of the topics uh, that they will be discussing. Um, how that turns out, I have no idea. I am hopeful that, that there will be... 
uh, uh, a recognition that uh, uh, people should be treated equally uh, when they are from another country and visiting a third country, uh, which says what you are saying in a different way. Okay, well, that's, that sounds positive. I have two more short questions. One is, uh, if I listen to you carefully, uh, in the, then I understand that the so-called FISA court will remain in place, but that you propose to add a privacy advocate rather than abolishing uh, this special court. And my final question would be, um, I think we all have an interest in, in strengthening uh, safeguards of the kind that you are proposing. Um, in what way could we cooperate and could we um, give support to, to your uh, initiative and maybe end up with a shared initiative across the Atlantic to make sure that things like this don't happen again? Well, first, you know, I can say that the sharing of intelligence is absolutely vital. Uh, in the fight against terrorism. Um, there can be things that are picked up here that we can't pick up and vice versa. And connecting the dots is important to stop a terrorist strike. Uh, if the dots had been properly connected, I think 9-11 never would have happened. Uh, so uh, this type of cooperation has been working fairly well uh, uh, with both law enforcement and the intelligence communities. and. Uh, uh, it should be continued, but it should be continued under supervision and oversight, uh, and it should be continued with a, at least a complementary legal framework, if not an identical legal framework. Now, with respect to the FISA court, uh, the Freedom Act proposes several things. First of all, uh, it does have the privacy advocate who uh, has standing before the FISA court to make arguments. Uh, this is something that was recommended by a judge who was on the FISA court who said that all they heard was the side of the NSA and the side of the Justice Department, and their job as judges is to listen to both sides and then to try to apply the facts and the law to reach a decision. And they really couldn't do that the way the court was set up, so the privacy advocate uh, would solve the problem. Uh, the privacy advocate would also have the standing to appeal a decision that the privacy advocate didn't agree with. But I think the most important thing of the uh, reforms that we proposed to the FISA court uh, is that when they change a policy, that they would have to make that public. But if they were talking about a, a FISA court order, for example, to get the business records of someone who is reasonably expect, is suspected of being a part of a terrorist operation, then that, of course, would be kept secret because letting the target know that they're being watched uh, is a good way to have the terrorists uh, go a different route to try to achieve their goals. Uh, so uh, the FISA court wouldn't be abolished. I think we need to have something like that. Uh, but I think the privacy advocate and the fact that when there is a change in policy uh, that becomes public and then would be subject to a public debate and also a potential change in the law if Congress thought that uh, the FISA court and the NSA and the Justice Department had all erred in interpreting the law as obviously they did in their reinterpretation of the Patriot Act beginning in 2007. Okay, thank you. That brings us to the... Děkuji. Nyní se přesouváme k dalším poslancům. Čtyři poslanci se hlásí o slovo. Pirka, Zipl a dva další. Ještě další se hlásí o slovo. Dobře, uzavírám. Seznam řečníků, pan Pirka. Thank you, madam. Děkuji, paní předsedkyně. Thank you, madam chairman. Thank you. You can understand now. Uh, thank you, that's the... Děkuji, pane Sensrenbrennere. Děkuji za ten velmi konstruktivní rozhovor. Thank you very much indeed, madam chairman. Mr. Congressman Sensenbrenner, I'm very appreciative of the fact that you've come here and that you're talking about the cooperation between us that is based on trust but also has to be based on legislation. You talked about the fact that 
mutual trust had taken a hit. You said that the NSA was totally out of control. And you said the NSA was ignoring the law every day. I very much welcome the frank manner in which you have discussed the issues that we've raised. And I'm very interested in knowing what's going to happen next. What do you think are the pieces of U.S. legislation that have been ignored by the NSA? And how exactly did it come to pass that the NSA ignored U.S. legislation? Secondly, with regard to the future, how can the NSA and the other intelligence agencies be controlled? Uh, what kind of scrutiny can they be made to work under in the interests both of security and cooperation with Europe? Further on the future, should the rules for the future uh, be binding as regards only to US citizens or also EU citizens because there are of course EU citizens data circulating and I would personally insist on those also being covered. Further with reference to SWIFT and the framework agreement between the USA and Europe, data protection in the context of criminal prosecution. When do you think that will become a reality? Mr. Sensenbinder. I'll do it in reverse order. Uh, uh, the data protection uh, in the case of criminal prosecutions, that will be the one of the subjects that will be discussed next weekend in the discussions between Commissioner Redding and Attorney General Holder. Uh, I doubt that there will be any final agreement, but uh, this will be a work in progress. Um, secondly, regardless of what the law is, uh, if an agency knows that it can ignore oversight or the oversight doesn't take place, uh, the agency will push its powers as far as it can. Uh, that's what the NSA has done, and uh, that's what those of us who think that the NSA has gone too far uh, want to stop. Uh, but even if the USA Freedom Act is passed, as Senator Leahy and I have introduced it, uh, unless there's oversight to blow the whistle when the whistle needs to be blown, uh, I uh, think that uh, there will be a, a further uh, pushing of the edge of the envelope, and that's why oversight is important. Oversight by Congress, oversight by the FISA court, as well as oversight by the White House. Now, finally, uh, relative to improving U.S. legislation, um, particularly as it respect, respects uh, the protections of EU citizens that are visiting the United States, uh, what I can say is that um, the issue is going to boil down to the legislation that Senator Leahy <coughs> and I have introduced and which I have described uh, and the legislation which has been introduced by Senator Feinstein and which was approved uh, a week and a half ago by the Senate Intelligence Committee by an 11 to 4 vote. That's scary to me because it does codify what the NSA has been doing in terms of bulk collections. Um, now they've been doing it just because they say the FISA court has authorized them to do it. If there is a change of opinion by the FISA court with new judges coming on it, uh, they can't stop it uh, uh, through a FISA court order because the Feinstein bill puts what the NSA has been doing now into law and says it's okay. Uh, it also makes matters worse for Europeans who happen to be visiting the United States by allowing up to 72 hours of warrantless surveillance of any foreigner who enters the United States without even getting the approval of the Attorney General to do that. Uh, so again, uh, uh, the political check on, on law enforcement uh, rests with the U.S. Attorney General, 
uh, the head of the cabinet department and a direct appointee of the President of the United States. And if uh, the NSA or law enforcement can do whatever they want in terms of surveilling foreigners uh, for 72 hours without telling the Attorney General about it, to me that is scary. Thank you, Mrs. Zippel. Yeah, vielen Dank. Ich würde auch. Yes. Thank you very much. I too should like to speak German. Whenever a country is attacked, its government considers measures to resist such attacks in future. That's why I have a great deal of understanding for the measures taken in the wake of 9-11. However, we are now 12 years on. Now, there is certainly still terrorism in the world, but the world has changed. My question is this. Was there ever a point during these 12 years when the U.S. administration, Congress or whoever, wondered if these measures decided back then were actually still worthwhile, fit for purpose, or had they perhaps become obsolete? Secondly, you talked uh, about uh, uh, trust is uh, good, uh, control is better. Whenever you give an agency powers and money, it inevitably takes on a life of its own. And that's why I wonder why over 12 years has no one actually decided to take a closer look at what the NSA and other agencies are doing to see if those measures are appropriate, if the citizens' uh, rights in the United States are being respected, and if the taxpayers' money is being well spent. Now, if we want once again to strike a balance between security and civil liberties, then just like here in Europe, uh, without the Snowden revelations, it would have been business as usual in the USA. And so my question is this, why has there been no proper scrutiny of the intelligence agencies up to now? The agencies have developed a life of their own, a momentum of their own. And isn't it worth the U.S. thinking of a different way of dealing with Mr. Snowden than it has hitherto? Um, to answer the first part of your question, when I drafted the Patriot Act, I was insistent that there be a four-year sunset. Uh, there were 16 expanded powers given to both law enforcement and the intelligence community. Uh, there was a 17th added in the Intelligence Reform Act relating to lone wolf uh, terrorists. Uh, but at the end of 2005, when the sunset was uh, expiring, uh, I fulfilled a promise that I made to my constituents as well as to the country that I would have individual hearings on each of these additional powers uh, before making a determination on whether to extend the law or not. Interestingly enough, 14 of the 17 powers were non-controversial and they were made permanent, uh, the most important of which was getting rid of the law which prohibited the CIA and the FBI from exchanging intelligence information, which the commission that investigated the 9-11 attacks said was one of the principal reasons why the terrorists were able to get away with what they did. One of the remaining uh, 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 provisions was Section 215, which is the one that has brought uh, most of the controversy, and that has been temporarily extended, and the current expiration date is June 1st of 2015. Now, I've made it quite plain in the run-up to the introduction of the bill that unless the intelligence community agrees to reform such as Senator Leahy and I have proposed, they run the risk of losing Section 215 altogether. And I do believe that uh, there 
is a necessity for a properly drafted and implemented business records uh, provision uh, in a uh, security and a surveillance act, but it should be targeted only at those for whom there is a reasonable suspicion that they are involved in terrorist activity and does not go beyond that. Now, um, uh, I think that, that what has happened uh, here is if you look at, at, at uh, uh, how the NSA has gone from only going after people that were targeted with reasonable suspicion of terrorist activity to what they are doing now is that the reauthorization in 2006 used the word relevant, meaning relevant to a, uh, a, a targeted uh, a terrorist. Uh, and most people would think that using the word relevant would actually narrow uh, the scope of an inquiry. Well, the NSA and the Justice Department uh, were able to convince the FISA court to expand it so that uh, grabbing everybody's phone records in the U.S. and in certain cases elsewhere would allow uh, them to data mine and to figure out from this data who might be suspected of being a terrorist. Uh, 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 the NSA officials in open hearings and open to the public uh, have slowly been pinned down and they've only said that there was one case with all of this data uh, that they were able to uh, uh, specifically say that the data they collected stopped a terrorist attack. One out of all of those that has been going on. Uh, had a huge invasion of privacy, and uh, the question has never been answered is without this reinterpretation of w what the word relevant means, uh, whether they would have been able to stop this terrorist attack using other means. Now, this all boils down to uh, uh, what type of oversight is being done. Uh, the FISA court and the Senate and House Intelligence Committees were created in the 70s, by a commission headed by then Senator Frank Church of Idaho following uh, a lot of uh, excesses by U.S. intelligence agencies at the time. And these institutions newly created were supposed to put the brake on uh, uh, excesses that the intelligence community might be doing. Well, it's evolved over time that instead of putting the brakes on, they've stepped on the gas, and they've been cheerleaders and apologists for whatever the NSA wants. And that's why you're having uh, uh, this conflict between the intelligence committees, including Senator Feinstein, who was the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and the Judiciary Committees, which uh, we operate a lot more in public uh, than the intelligence committees do, uh, uh, Senator Leahy as the chairman of the Senate uh, committee. I used to be the chairman uh, uh, of the House committee, and uh, uh, we know that uh, what is being done is wrong, and we know that uh, what is being done is a twisting of the law, and we want to stop it from happening, and we want to prevent it from happening again. Thank you. As uh, some more colleagues have come forward, I still have four uh, speakers on my list, so I'm going to ask everybody to, uh, to show some self-discipline and, um, and, and be brief. Uh, next one on the list, Mr. Torvalds. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and Mr. Sensenbrenner, I think we are in good hands, those who know um, American policy, politics in the 90s and know your how much you worked in the Levinsky case, knows that you're, you're trying to get out the things out you're, you're getting for. But I think you have a, quite a challenge here. When we look at the amount of data out there now, and in comparison with what we had in 9-11, for instance, it's immensely more. Uh, and we happen to know that uh, there is a lot of bad programming out there. So to be able to, to really protect the data of, of uh, citizens, American or, or European, with backdoors in almost every program, intentional or unintentional, with slappy programming, with backdoors on uh, motherboards and so on, you probably are in for a harder fight than you were in the 90s to get, get things done. But I would 
very much like to hear your, your, your opinion on how, how immense or how huge this problem actually is. Thank well, you. There's no question that for Senator Leahy and me to win, uh, we have to fight uh, the administration, we have to fight the leadership of our respective parties and respective houses of Congress, uh, 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 as well as uh, uh, the Intelligence Committee members. Uh, I think a very hopeful sign was the fact that the amendment to defund the bulk collection program that was offered by Representative Amash of Michigan in late July only failed by seven votes. And I think that this was a wake-up call to uh, the folks on the other side uh, that there's something seriously wrong. And there was not an extended debate on the Amash Amendment. Uh, it literally came up, uh, was debated and voted upon in the course of about 24 hours. Now, that was two and a half, three and a half months ago. Uh, there's now been more of a debate. And uh, I think particularly telling was after the Amash Amendment was defeated by such a narrow margin, uh, the Inspector General of the NSA said that they had uh, violated their own regulations thousands of times during the period that was examined. Uh, so uh, obviously the people who are working for the NSA uh, uh, are not sensitive to even their own agency's regulations. So I think the time has come uh, to clip their wings, and as more debate goes on on this issue, uh, I think there will be more support. The, the real question is being able to get a vote <coughs> on our proposals uh, in the House and in the Senate. And uh, I'm very happy that Senator Leahy has signed on. He's the most senior member of the Senate, he is the president pro tempore. He's also fourth in line to the presidency. Okay, thank you. Next speaker, Mr. Romeva. Thank you so much. Um, actually, we've been speaking a lot about the consequences of this uh, breaking of this misuse of the civil protection laws by the NSA uh, at the political level, at the uh, intergovernmental level even. Uh, my question is uh, well, quite, quite direct too. Uh, what is your perception, or what is your feeling about the fact that this is being used uh, in order to control some critical movements, legitimate political critical movements, like for instance the Occupy Wall Street or in, in the case of Spain, for instance, Indignados, under the coverage of the self-defense uh, on the, on the terror on the terrorism uh, risk or whatsoever. So actually in that, in that, in that aspect, uh, more than uh, simply a question of intergovernmental uh, tension, there is also a lack of uh, confidence in between some political movements and some polit social movements, I would say, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the governments in general, basically because some of them have been cooperating so far on, on, this, on this initiative. So what is your perception from the US, uh, US side and uh, what is uh, uh, your feeling about this is going to be uh, evolving in the, in, the, in the next future? What I can say to respond to that is that in terms of domestic politics in the member states of the EU, uh, I don't think that this is really uh, the business of, of dealing with that, that has to be dealt uh, within the member states and pursuant to the treaties here in uh, Brussels. Uh, however, uh, one of the things that we have to always be cognizant of uh, is the fact that effective anti-terrorism investigations involve uh, the sharing of intelligence information. And uh, again, it is my hope that uh, the Freedom Act can restore the balance between uh, security and freedom and civil liberties uh, that uh, I thought we had done in the Patriot Act, and which was done before uh, the FISA court decided that the term relevant was expanding rather than contracting. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Ludford. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and I add my thanks to those of others, to Representative Sensenbrenner for taking the trouble to come and speak to us. It's really much appreciated. Um, what uh, occurred to me is that um, I just wondered uh, whether you were having any opportunity or thought there might be an opportunity 
to um, have a dialogue with politicians in London, um, across the political spectrum actually, but perhaps you're particularly well placed to speak to the Conservative Party politicians, um, because as you are probably aware, there hasn't been anything like the debate, either parliamentary or public, in London as there has been in, in Washington. And uh, I mean, even to the extent of talk from our Prime Minister of uh, prosecuting the Guardian newspaper, which carried the Snowden revelations, which I think would be impossible in the United States. Um, I just wondered whether you would uh, rise to my bait uh, and, and venture any views on the, uh, the, the lack of a vigorous debate in London, which of course is having repercussions within the EU and uh, is not helpful to reaching a new settlement, if you like, between the EU and the United States on data protection and uh, you know, balancing that with the demands of uh, data sharing? Well, I, I'm not going to rise to your bait. Uh, uh, you know, what I can say uh, in terms of a national government of a member state um, dealing with uh, the security and intelligence uh, apparatus within that member state uh, should be kept at, uh, at home. And uh, I think one of the reasons why I am here today at your invitation uh, is because of the implications that the bulk data collection uh, has had uh, in Europe and in uh, a, few country, a few countries in particular. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm always happy to talk about the dividing line between civil liberties and, and security, uh, but I'm not here to say that what I have proposed in the past and am proposing to uh, amend now should be a uniform law on data protection that applies all around the civilized world. Uh, because it, 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 you know, it simply will not work because of various types of organizational and constitutional restrictions. So uh, thanks for your invitation to London. I think I'll come, but not for that purpose. Thank you. Last speaker on the list, Mr. Engström. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator, you mentioned that, that when pressed, the NSA ha had said that, that all this surveillance uh, had led, led to one terrorist plot being foiled. Uh, in this, uh, okay, that's not an awful lot, but still it's something. In, in the, this one case, did that lead to, to any convictions? Because, I mean, as we all know, uh, preparing uh, terrorism is, is a very, very serious crime, very often ca carries the same sentences as actually carrying it out. So in this case, did it lead to any convictions or, or what happened to the suspects? Uh, the answer is yes, it did uh, lead to a conviction, but it was on the f financing aspect uh, of what was being proposed, not an attack itself. And if I can digress one step, uh, the difference between terrorism and ordinary criminal activity is if a crime is committed, then law enforcement acts in a reactive mode. Uh, you know, they see the murder, they uh, get the evidence, uh, uh, they interview the witnesses. If they're able to prove their case, they turn it over to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor then brings the case to court. When we're dealing with terrorism, however, we've got to be proactive rather than reactive because of the number of lives that uh, would be at stake. Now, uh, there were almost 3,000 lives lost in 9-11 in the three attacks that were successful, plus the plane that the, po that the passengers crashed in western Pennsylvania. Uh, however, if an attack occurs uh, at a crowded stadium during a sporting event uh, or something like that, there may be tens of thousands of people that would be put at risk, and that's why we have to stop them before they, they do attack. And this is basically uh, the, the premise upon which I have based legislative responses that I have, have been involved in, and that is, is that this is going to require intelligence, surveillance, and in certain cases infiltration as well. But it has to be done under a constitutional framework, uh, and it has to be done following the law uh, of whatever law applies where the actions are taking place. 
Now, if uh, terrorists in Germany were plotting an attack on the United States, um, in terms of the investigation that occurs in Germany, in my opinion, that should be uh, done strictly pursuant to German law. There should not be any extraterritoriality of, of American law on this. However, if the plotters, whether they be German nationals or nationals of some other country, come to the U.S., we can use the uh, evidence that has been uh, assembled pursuant to German law uh, to try to stop them from doing that and introducing that evidence in the U.S. court pursuant to our rules of evidence. Thank you very much. Uh, th that last remark triggers <coughs> something because the extraterritoriality is a big problem because um, it doesn't require the physical presence of a potential terrorist on U.S. soil. That's the whole problem. Uh, all the U.S. need are is, is access to that person's data on U.S. soil or anywhere else in the world. So, you know, there is effective extraterritoriality, even if a person is, is plotting a terrorist attack, you know, anywhere else in the world, even in Germany. Um, there's, we have one minute left where we can take an extra minute, and Jan Albrecht wanted to ask one additional question. Yeah, let me just ask one final question referring to that, uh, because there is the FISA Act, and uh, the question comes if uh, under the FISA Act uh, there is an application uh, to EU citizens' personal data, uh, there's no redress possibilities, and also there's no way for EU citizens, for example, to the Supreme Court at the end. So what do you think about that, and do you also uh, have a plan to, towards this question when coming to your Well, un uh, under the FISA Act, uh, uh, a U.S. citizen probably would not know if the FISA Court entered an order uh, allowing an intelligence or law enforcement agency not exclusive to, to the NSA uh, to have access to that person's information. Now, if uh, the person was indicted in a U.S. court, uh, then our rules of uh, criminal procedure require the disclosure of that information to the defense counsel in order to prepare uh, a defense if the uh, uh, information was not legally obtained, for example, they would make a uh, motion to exclude that as evidence in the U.S. court and the judge would rule on it. There's, there's a differentiation between U.S. citizens or residents and all other people and, and that is the question which I would like to raise. How do you deal with that uh, discrimination at the end? Well, uh, uh, again, this goes back to the meeting that Commissioner Redding and Attorney General Holder will be having next weekend uh, in Washington on what kind of a legal arrangement uh, there would be made uh, on this. Uh, I think probably the, the best example is an EU citizen being placed on a U.S. no-fly list uh, and uh, not being able to board a plane even though they have nothing to do with anything uh, terrorist-related. Now, I, that's happened with U.S. citizens, including Senator Kennedy, because apparently there was someone of a similar name that was affiliated with the IRA uh, in Northern Ireland, and it took Senator Kennedy a quicker time to get back on the okay-to-fly list than most people would have. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the end of this session. I would like to thank Congressman Sensenbrenner for uh, uh, his presence here and his willingness to um, answer questions. And I hope I can count on you um, on your commitment to the continued dialogue, because I think there, there are many issues that we want to address uh, in months and years to come. And I think um, if, if, if members can be quiet for a little bit more. Uh, you just said that it will be impossible to have you know, one global privacy law uh, because we, we live in different systems. That is true. At the same time, I think that we all operate on the basis of uh, the same principles uh, and what you would call relevance, for example, for us would be necessity and proportionality. And I think there should be ways, if we can cooperate on many things, 
uh, there should be ways to also cooperate on the protection of civil liberties because I think that that is something that we, that we share and it will definitely be a precondition for successful talks on the free trade agreement um, that we all want to succeed. So I hope that we can pledge here to meet again um, sometime next spring and continue our good cooperation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, then um, the seats on the podium will be taken by the speakers for our next panel. Second session, the role of parliamentary oversight of intelligence services at national level in an era of mass surveillance. Uh, we have two guest speakers. First of all, Mr. Peter Eriksson, who is on his way. Uh, chair of the Committee on the Constitution in the Swedish Parliament, and the second speaker, Mr. Van Delden, Chair of the Dutch Independent Review Committee on the Intelligence and Security Services. Okay, colleagues, we continue with the second session. If those who are having a conversation could take that conversation outside, please. Mr. Albrecht. Okay. So we welcome to the podium Mr. Eriksson and Mr. Van Delden. I'm going to uh, invite both gentlemen to uh, make a short introduction of about 10 minutes each, uh, and then we'll open the floor for questions and debate. Uh, I first invite point of order, Mr. Pirker. Yeah, thank you, Frau Präsidentin. Ich hab thank you very much. Well, on behalf of the Swedish delegation, I have a question because uh, there's a certain lack of clarity that's arisen, and I've asked to, I've been asked to raise this question right at the start of the session. Now, in Sweden, the committee on the constitution is not the responsible committee in the Swedish par Parliament for what we are discussing here today, namely data protection of signals intelligence. And the question from the Swedish delegation, therefore, was why was Mr. Eriksson invited? Is Mr. Eriksson here as a speaker of the uh, committee in the Swedish Parliament uh, that he is the chair of, even though it isn't really the committee that has uh, competence in this area? Or is there another explanation for why it is that Mr. Eriksson was invited? I think the answer is already in your email. It was sent to us uh, shortly before the start of this meeting. Uh, and if I understand correctly, this is, there are two committees responsible in the Swedish Parliament. This is one of the two committees. Uh, I understand the request for a speaker has been made through the, the normal official <coughs> uh, parliamentary channels, uh, and Mr. Eriksson has been uh, proposed to us by the Swedish Parliament. So uh, I don't think there is, uh, there is any issue there. So uh, if, if that has clarified the matter, I'm going to invite Mr. Eriksson to take the floor. Thank you very much. I, I shall start by, by um, answering a, a bit of your uh, wondering. I, I heard about this irritation from, from Mrs. Also, Mrs. Corazza Bildt, the, the wife of the Swedish uh, foreign minister. And, uh, and it's actually so that we have uh, three committees in the Swedish parliament that in different ways are responsible for this matter. And I should say, probably the most, the, the, the committee that is most engaged right now in, in this is uh, the defense committee. Because it, it, it obviously uh, goes around uh, quite a lot of uh, defense policy matters, and, and uh, uh, they are very much engaged uh, right now in, in these things. And, and uh, by that, it, it, it's also the, the committee of justice. And uh, the Committee of Constitution is uh, responsible for the civil li liberties, for, for example, integrity matters. And 
that's the reason why also the, the committee of the constitution is partly responsible for this. So you're right in a way, but uh, not maybe entirely. Uh, I hope that uh, you feel that it's okay that I uh, go over to, to Swedish in, in, uh, my, my, when I'm uh, speaking. Then uh, maybe we can take it in English uh, uh, when we go over to, to questions and answers. Because uh, it's, about, uh, it's a bit technical, these things, and I would rather speak in Swedish so that I won't say anything that could be wrong to you. Thank you. Now, the situation in Sweden on questions to do with signals intelligence and the monitor monitoring of the Internet, amongst other things, is as follows. Now, in the year 2008 to 2009, we had a very major comprehensive debate on this subject because the Swedish government tabled a new piece of proposed legislation to regulate signals intelligence and monitoring, which up to that point had not been regulated really. Now, when that debate took place, there was major criticism of the proposed legislation from a large number of organisations, both within the parliament and also outside of the Swedish parliament. Now, the criticism was, to a large extent, as to whether it was appropriate to monitor and listen in to people in Sweden who were not under suspicion. Now, the focus was on questions to do with integrity and also whether Swedes should be the subject of such listening into within the country. Now, there were quite a number of people within the government itself who voiced criticism, and a number of the coalition partners had members of parliament who couldn't uh, support the government's proposal. And that led, amongst other things, to the proposal being revised. There were a number of changes that were made. Now, the law was adopted and let me just go through briefly what the results were and what the instruments were that were set up and adopted. And then I'd like to go back to the current state of the debate on these questions. Now we have a state authority, the FRA, which is the National Defence Radio Establishment, and it's that body that's responsible for signals, intelligence and monitoring under the law. And then alongside that, we have a number of authorities to provide checks and balances. Now the main scrutiny is carried out by the Defence Intelligence Court. They have to give the green light to any intelligence activities to the National Defence Radio Establishment. But there's a third organisation as well, the Defence Intelligence Committee, the SIUN in Swedish, which takes the day-to-day -day control and scrutiny and makes sure that the National Defence Radio Establishment follows what the court has said. Now, any authorization to listen in is given only for six months and then has to be re-examined. And uh, it's the court that decides what search terms can be uh, looked for by the National Defence Radio Establishment and defines what categories can be used uh, for searches. The basic rule is that if the sender and the receiver are both in Sweden, well then search monitoring cannot be allowed.
but a great deal of what uh, the National Defence Radio Establishment is interested in relates to uh, communications which go through Sweden from and to third countries. So there's a large amount of information that can be used without the legal limitations actually having to apply. Now, the Defense Intelligence Commission doesn't just uh, decide on search terms that can be used, but also it looks into questions of uh, reporting and weighs up the balance between uh, the uh, disturbance to personal integrity and the need for intelligence. There's another authority as well that's involved in the scrutiny of the National Defense Radio Establishment's work, and it re looks closely at uh, integrity questions, and that is the National Data Commission. That is the authority that uh, really looks into and balances up questions of private integrity and data protection on the Internet and what authorization should be given to the various authorities to uh, monitor personal data. Now, if we go back to what's actually happening today, well, you see there's a large amount of activity in the Swedish parliament right now. Last Friday, there was a general debate on the link between the NSA and the Swedish National Defence Radio Establishment. Now, one problem well, let me say that, uh, first of all, that this debate these days is not as intense as it was back in 2008 and 2009. Now, one problem that people see in Sweden is that we have quite a, a weak level of parliamentary control on these questions. Criticism has also been levelled at certain loopholes uh, in the legislation, which can allow for the monitoring of Swedish people in Sweden. And there's uh, a lot of uncertainty in Sweden as to cooperation with third countries and the right direction to go in and uh, what the knock-on effects might be on the uh, spying on Swedish and European citizens. And these concerns have come about in particular because parliamentary control and scrutiny is not as strong as it should be. Now, once a year, Parliament, the Swedish Parliament, that is, has to look into the uh, uh, amount of signals intelligence monitoring that has been carried out in accordance with the terms of the new legislation. Above all, I think in Sweden we have a long history of uh, signals intelligence monitoring. We have a high level of uh, technical competence within our defence forces and also in civil industry on these questions. The Swedish defence authorities and the government think that these are very important and strategic questions for the defence of the country. And the government places a high value on the inform information that we get in and that we can use. It's something that is seen as being extremely important. And I think that is partly goes some way to explain why it is that uh, the government is always quite cautious uh, and hasn't perhaps uh, criticized uh, the, these act the United States activities as much as some other countries in Europe might have done. Now, I am a member of the Greens in the Parliament, so I sit in the opposition. Now, we were not happy with the new signals intelligence law when it was adopted. We didn't think it really was based around questions of personal integrity. And, in fact, uh, we felt that questions relating to integrity really fell by the wayside. They were not a high priority at all. And so we didn't feel that the law provided enough uh, data protection 
we want the law to be completely reviewed and uh, a new law should be centred around issues of um, openness, transparency and personal integrity. Furthermore, personal scru uh, parliamentary scrutiny rather should be improved as far as we're concerned. And this is being debated also in the Swedish parliament. The social democrats in the parliament uh, also think that uh, there should be better protection against corporate espionage and that more resources should be earmarked to prevent espionage from third countries taking place. And that, of course, ties in with the discussions relating to the NSA. Now, the parliamentary situation is perhaps uh, less good when it comes to uh, trying to get support for revising this legislation now, earlier things were rather better. Uh, before 2010, before the elections then, the Greens, the Social Democrats and the left had a common platform uh, to get rid of the current legislation and replace it with new legislation on signals intelligence which uh, focuses more on personal integrity and transparency. The Social Democrats have backed away from that position now and they rather more support the government line which uh, defends the legislation that's currently in place. Now, uh, it might be possible to uh, make smaller changes to the law, but I think the chance of completely reforming the law now is rather, uh, uh, rather smaller than they were before. So, I think uh, I can leave it there uh, for my introduction, and I'm, but I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. But I'm not a member of the Defence Committee, so I don't really have that background, uh, which would, might allow me to answer questions in as much detail as you might want. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the first round of questions. Uh, first rapporteur and shadows, um, Mr. Moraes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I think the first thing to say is that um, just in terms of the first set of comments that were made on your response, we are trying in this inquiry to do this impossible task of um, within the time limitations we have, we're reporting in February, to survey some of the key um, uh, controversies and member states' intelligence Situations. So, for example, in the last hearing we looked at the UK mm. situation and today we're looking at Sweden and the Netherlands. This is by its very definition an imperfect uh, way to do things, but it's, it's a snapshot of um, what, you know, what the situation is within the European Union. So by its very definition it's, it's not going to be a perfect situation. But, um, and I'm not an expert on the Swedish situation. We're inviting you as Chairman of the Constitution committee, not to give a party political view, but to give a sense of whether you think oversight is working um, and whether you think it needs to be changed in some way. So my question, as we've asked the questions of the United Kingdom and we'll be asking with Netherlands, is has the recent controversy and we've seen allegations about you know, further spying on third countries or intelligence sharing with Denmark and Finland and so on, I and mean, these are the allegations we're hearing and we're, we're looking at allegations. Is this sort of data sharing problems when we've seen that there is a legal framework? Now you've criticised the legal framework, but is it a problem with the legal framework? Is it a problem with practice? And is it within the capacity now of the Swedish Parliament to reform this? Is there a, a you know, is it going to be reforming? Mean, what's your sense of where this is going? And I'm sure other members are going to give their opinion. But what do you, or not, <laughs> and what, what do you think, I mean, what do you think um, is the solution to this? Is it a change in law or is it a change in practice? I mean, g give us a sense. I mean, we're, we're going to be in this inquiry looking at these snapshots in, in member states. And Sweden, of course, was one of those situations. So just give us a sense of wh where you think this is going in terms of reform. Okay, Mr. Eriksson. Yes, I... I reckon that it's possible to sharpen the tools of control in many ways. Maybe we should see that the 
uh, defends uh, the authority, the, 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 the justice uh, court for, that gives the authorities to, 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 to um, the FRA uh, is, um, has more integrity towards the government. And uh, I think that uh, the, the Swedish parliament could have a better control of, of uh, what, what is happening in the authorities because uh, uh, we see now the, the even not the defense committee uh, seems to have a, a decent control of what is happening. So uh, it's not uh, at all okay, what I feel, in, in that sense. And uh, you can do uh, quite a lot of things better there. And, uh, uh, but th that's still mostly uh, what is regulated is mostly what is uh, uh, in the surveillance over Swedish people in Sweden. So. And the other thing, spying on other countries, looking on, on, on the cables uh, of, of, of things, I, I believe that uh, probably uh, we have to negotiate some deals between, and I, I should uh, suggest that we try to make a, a deal in the European uh, Union. The countries within the European Union should not uh, spy on each other. That should be the, uh, the, the thing that would be possible to do, I think, and, uh, uh, or, or at least uh, make a deal on, on, on what basis these kind of, of surveillance should, should be under. And then the next step would be to, to have that deal and, and uh, go to the United States and say, here is our deal within uh, Europe and uh, on, on, on spying on each other or making a, a, a mass surveillance on, on the people and authorities and politicians and, and companies here. We would like you to join us in some kind of a basic uh, uh, integrity deal around these matters. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I, I can't say if I know it, this is realistic to do, but, but I, I feel it should be realistic within the European Union. What else is the European Union for? It is, uh, the people talk that we should have a common defense, but if we can't do this, the, 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 it's just bullshit, I think. With, with some kind of parliamentary um, terms. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's not parliamentary um, <laughs> we'll strike that from the record. Yeah, we strike that. Uh, yeah. That mm. might be okay. Well, it's been picked up by the NSA, so we can strike it as much as we like. <laughs> yeah, <we're, laughs> and it's been web streamed. Uh, I suppose the entire EPP is exercising its uh, right of parliamentary scrutiny from uh, behind their uh, internet screens or their computer. Uh, uh, screens and watching the web stream because there's nobody here from the EPP so that brings us to the next shadow Mr. Albrecht. Can I ask colleagues to be uh, a bit more concise because we are beginning to run a little bit behind schedule. Okay, thank you very much. I try to be short and focus on some questions uh, which I'm interested in factual or, or also your views on it. Uh, first, uh, on the uh, parliamentary scrutiny, do you know about any involvement of the Swedish parliamentarians in a cooperative uh, inquiry of national parliaments to what uh, national security issues or surveillance matters uh, refer to? So I, I, I just, I'm just interested in uh, is, is there anything happening also between the national parliaments? Uh, is there an institutional uh, work on that. Also, with regard to one question which I'm very interested in, did you ever hear uh, or heard about INTSEN? And, uh, or do you think that colleagues of you did heard of INTSEN and um, what they are doing and on which legal basis? You don't need to say yes, but because I, I, I think I already know the answer, but um, uh, and last but not least, uh, I mean, Europe, and that's, I think, a very good thing uh, that we have you with here working on constitutional issues. And I think when we look at our uh, member states here, it's about constitutional questions. And there you also mentioned uh, about the European Union. 
about uh, member states spying on, on each other. I mean, how do you, as parliamentarians in the Constitutional uh, Committee, deal with the problem that obviously uh, the laws of other member states are enforced in your territory? For example, by having cyber attacks by the GCHQ here in Belgium on the Belgian company Belgacom, or obviously also cyber attacks of the GCHQ on the servers of Google or Yahoo. I don't know if there are any in Sweden, but I know they are in Finland. And uh, do you deal with that, and uh, how do you think uh, uh, this has to be dealt with by parliamentarians? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I ask you to be equally concise yes. in answering? Well, uh, some of the questions is no, so it's quite short. But, but uh, uh, the last one, uh, we, uh, one of my uh, things that I wanted to stress is uh, that we have to be much more uh, better on, on um, uh, uh, protecting uh, companies uh, against uh, attacks on uh, cyber attacks. Uh, we, have, we know that there are uh, lots of intelligence and lots of money and lots of resources going into attacks against companies. And, and uh, if we uh, want the, the, the European companies to be competitive, we have to build up uh, better uh, defense around this uh, in, in the future, I think. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other two shadows of the ECR and GUE are absent, so that brings it to me. Uh, two questions. You mentioned the possibility of a no-spy agreement, and I, I know that idea is being floated in several member states. I'm a bit puzzled by it, frankly, because you know, either spying is legal, and then you know, there's no need to conclude an agreement against it, or it's not legal and then we shouldn't be doing it in the first place. So exactly what would be the added value of a no-spy agreement? I mean, countries are hardly going to tell each other that they, they spy on each other until there is a whistleblower. Uh, and the second question is, uh, I'm, uh, I was struck by the expression you used that there is weak parliamentary control in Sweden, because I think one of the, one of the things we learned in previous sessions is that... Um, Sweden is very much a, a hub in, in the whole telecommunications network uh, and therefore essential in the whole um, you know, spying network between the US and, and the UK. And, um, so I would say that strong parliamentary control, strong parliamentary oversight is even more important in Sweden than uh, in many other EU countries. I agree. But, but we, we had that uh, quite a big debate on, on that, on, on the parliamentarian control. But uh, this is what we got when we had uh, took this law some years ago. Now we have seen the law working for some years, and and I um, feel very strong that we need uh, uh, to to uh, strengthen the part of the parliamentarian control to make it, the, the the legal framework work as it was uh, thought. To be, uh, but but um, uh, it, this is uh, still a, a question in Sweden. So uh, we have a, and we have an election next year. So I, I believe this could be one of the topics that we are discussing then. But the the deal on on um, that I was talking about, uh, it it is uh, to make it illegal. It, it's not illegal today in Sweden. This. Uh, 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 and, and, and it is a national framework in almost every country, this. And uh, since uh, we have no international um, negotiations and no deals on, on, on uh, European or other levels uh, around uh, these matters, it will be legal to spy on each other how much you want to. Okay, thank you. I have two requests for the floor by Mr. Torvalds and Mr. Engstrom. Mr. Torvalds first. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm going to take the opportunity to speak in my mother tongue. After all, this is a question which uh, touches upon the relations between Sweden and Finland. Now, um, back in 1939, people in Sweden said that uh, what applies or what matters to Finland matters to Sweden. Um, but uh, 
since then, things have rather changed, and it now seems to be that uh, um, what happens in the Baltic is important to Sweden. And uh, since then, of course, we've uh, seen people being very upset about what the United States is doing, but we're perhaps rather less upset with uh, what uh, Sweden is doing to um, its uh, neighbouring countries, which perhaps is somewhat hypocritical. Uh. Well, yes, it's true that a lot of the cable network is com coming uh, through Sweden from countries in the Baltic. That's very true. Uh, not just Finland, in fact, but other Baltic countries. And uh, that's a very relevant point that you make. And so it's true that we're dealing here with questions which are strategically very important for Sweden. And if we really were going to look into this idea of reaching agreements between Sweden, Finland and the Baltic countries, but also at a European level as to uh, what things we are allowed to look for and search for in this, uh, in this network of cables, well then things would be uh, properly put into a legal framework. But things are open at the moment and I think from a legal point of view there's really no limitation for uh, the Swedish National Defence Radio establishment to look for what they wish. Thank you. Last speaker in this round, uh, Mr. Engström. Well, thank you very much. I'm also going to take the opportunity to speak Swedish. Well, to start with, I'd just like to confirm what you said at the start, namely that when the National Defence Radio law was passed in Sweden, there was a great deal of debate in Sweden and outside. Now, um, I can confirm that that indeed was the case, but it's true that uh, colleagues here in this uh, committee are also very uh, familiar with uh, the Swedish issue because uh, uh, it's been mentioned in hearings here in Parliament, and I think there are eight authorities that have the right now to order monitoring to be carried out from the National Defence Radio establishment. You could split them into three groups. You have the military, the first group, and then you have the police, including the security services, which would be the second group. And the third group is uh, political institutions, the government, for example, uh, the cabinet, uh, the foreign office, and so on, who are all entitled to ask for monitoring to be carried out. Now, my question to you, as a member of the, of the chair of the Constitutional Committee, well, if you look at the demands that come in to the National Defence Radio Establishment, how, what proportion is military, what proportion is police-based, and what proportion would be uh, civilian or political? Well, I'm afraid I can't answer that question, not because I want to keep secrets, but because uh, that's just not something I don't know. The, I just don't know the answer to that question. Okay, that's, that's very honest. <laughs> that, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us um, to the end of this round. Thank you uh, to Mr. Eriksson. Um, our next speaker is um, Mr. Van Delden, who is chair of the Dutch Independent Review Committee on the Intelligence and Security Services, uh, also known as CTIVD in the Netherlands. You have the floor for about 10 minutes. Thank you. I will ook maar van de gelegenheid. Well, thank you. I'm also going to take the opportunity to speak Dutch, at least at the start of my presentation. Now, I am a lawyer. That's what my career has been. And uh, you have law in the books and law in action. That's what I have learnt. And quite often, law in action is even more important than law in the books. And for that reason, I'd like to perhaps take a step back. And I don't want to start with uh, the oversight review. Those terms are often mixed up, in fact. But I think uh, you need to focus on the services themselves. Now we have the military intelligence service and we have the general intelligence and security services in the Netherlands. Now, it's those two services who need 
to, at all times, make sure they respect the terms of the law. And every time that that is violated, they need, of course, to make sure that uh, any sanctions are proportional and uh, respect subsidiarity, proportionality, and so on. If those rules are not respected, then we really run into problems. And so that's why we need to make sure that staff who work in these services are properly trained. Now, if these services do their job properly, well, then, in any case, when um, uh, these sorts of monitoring uh, services are carried out, they need the right uh, authorization given by the relevant ministries. Now, the ministers, of course, uh, are supported by their staff, including lawyers, and so things are looked at thoroughly, and it's only when the green light is given that when the, only then can the security services carry out uh, actions such as tapping telephone lines and so on. And it's only after that that uh, supervision is carried out. And in the Netherlands, we have the committee, an independent committee, in fact, which is non-parliamentary. Uh, it's not uh, political in any way, and the appointments are not uh, political either. It's the Review Committee on the Intelligence and Security Services, which I'm a member of, and this committee has unlimited access to all of uh, the uh, information that the security services deal with. We have the same authorization levels as the directors of the security services, and so we can uh, look into everything, although we can see everything, this is worth saying, but uh, we can't really look into everything because the security services have hundreds of members of staff and my committee just has six researchers and three part-time members of the committee so uh, you know we're rather smaller nevertheless we can keep a very close eye on what these services do we write reports on the services activities which are passed on to the relevant ministries and uh, then on to parliament and these are publicly available reports in the public domain and so if something has gone wrong, something which is against the law has taken place, then this ends up mentioned in a public report. Now, you can't always go into it in detail because you have problems with secrecy, but at least we mentioned that a mistake has been committed by a service. Now, if necessary, and this is almost always necessary, uh, we also uh, write secret reports where we put in detail what we have discovered uh, and then the when we ask questions the security services uh, uh, are obliged to answer our questions and make people available to answer them and then we write all this down in a report this time a secret report and that's passed on to the ministers concerned and then on to parliament but then this isn't passed on to all members of parliament and this is always a difficult question in fact in the Dutch parliament uh, it's uh, only passed on, in fact, to the Committee for Intelligence and Security Services, which uh, uh, is a committee made up of the uh, heads of the political parties in the Dutch Parliament. So nothing is kept secret from the Dutch Parliament, even if it's true that not all members of Parliament can get this information. It's only a limited group of uh, MPs. So I think that is... Uh, uh, a remarkable, a very good system. Now, the law is 10 years old now, and there has been a discussion as to whether we should strengthen the uh, Dutch Independent Review Committee, because at the moment we only have an advisory role, even though uh, our advice is taken very seriously. And in the six years that I've been a member of this committee, there was only one uh, case where the minister took a different point of view from the committee and had decided that he did not wish to follow the advice given by the Independent Review Committee. So I think that this uh, is uh, something that uh, is worth noting. Now there's a committee which this week is going to be producing a report as to what the legislative opportunities are for a review of the law to take place. And uh, I imagine that in that uh, document uh, they will recommend that the position of our report of our review committee will be strengthened that we shouldn't just have an advisory role now in the netherlands there's a major discussion as well as to, about the uh, major amounts of interception taking place uh, and uh, 
the Dutch Parliament has called upon our committee to investigate in what's been happening with the NSA affair. And that's probably a report we're going to be ready with at the end uh, by mid-December and then it will be passed on to Parliament for debate in January. And we will be able to tell them what we have discovered or have not discovered, in fact. Now, there is a debate ongoing in the Netherlands uh, and I think also in Sweden, namely that our s services uh, um, currently can only intercept... Uh, uh, intelligence from the air, not from cables. Now, in the me meantime, since the law was adopted, the lion's share of information is exchanged via cables. And so the secu security services now say that they have an urgent need to be able to intercept information on cables as well. And uh, so that they can treat information from cables in the same way as they treat information from the air. Now that sounds like a major amount of uh, data interception, but personally I think that uh, it uh, is going to be reasonable because uh, you can of course gather in information, but you have to actually do something with it. And when you actually want to start searching for keywords or something in particular, addresses or telephone numbers or whatever it might be, well, then you will need to get a green light from a minister. So the services, as far as I'm concerned, the, I'm convinced that the services won't be able to just search for anything without the authorization of a minister. And then it will be followed up and scrutinized by my independent committee. So I think that uh, everything will, be, will happen in a legal framework. But you need to make sure the security services have the right mentality. If you look at what the possibilities are, to cooperate internationally on questions of supervision, well, they're really very, very limited. There's a, a biannual conference of the International Intelligence Review Authorities, the ERA. That conference is organized by the so-called Anglo-Saxon countries, and a couple of countries such as Belgium and the Netherlands uh, take part in that conference every time. But it seems that every country only really can uh, keep tabs and monitor on their own national system and it's very difficult to exchange information about uh, how other country systems work. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, ask the Brits or ask the Americans what are you actually doing with your own security services and it's difficult for us to give information on that kind of thing as well because we're bound by our own national secrecy laws. Of course we can talk and provide information to our own national parliaments uh, but it's always very difficult to provide information over and across national borders. So I think I'm going to leave it there, but I'm open to your questions. Thank you, well. uh, I'll... Thank you very much. Rapporteur, Mr. Moraes. Okay. Um, again, as I said with Mr. Erickson, we're going into um, various snapshots of different um, intelligence positions in different member states, and we're looking at the oversight situation there and particular controversies in those countries. Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Van Delden, but um, you, you've given an overview of what is happening in the Netherlands. But um, and please correct this if this is inaccurate in any way. But in a press interview over the weekend, you were talking about a new system that's being set up or new software that is um, being prepared or that was being reported. Um, please, well, correct it if it's wrong or, or give us some some sort of explanation. But this would give new capabilities, I think, to the Dutch intelligence services. And um, if that's happening, or if there's an upgrade, then h how is your oversight capabilities going to um, keep up with that? And the, the Dutch are part of the Nine Eyes um, Agreement. Is that, is that the case? Um, if, and if that's the case, could I just take the opportunity to ask you what you thought um, of what we heard when we were in Washington, which was a beginning of the rebuttal from the NSA um, about what was happening to... Um, this, the mass surveillance allegations uh, that they were talking about, um, various concepts of EU involvement, what, what you thought of that, what was your reaction to that from the, from the Dutch point of view, given that you're part of the Nine Eyes agreement, it would be interesting to know what your reaction was from your committee. Mayor van Delden. First of all, this new system, what 
maybe uh, will come to life in, uh, some, in some time. That's not quite sure how this will work out. And in any case, that's nothing we are concerned with. That's only for the minister and the services to do it. And our role is only to monitor what they are going to do with it. Uh, it might be a wonderful system um, according to them, uh, but we still have to follow the law and we'll see if they stick close to the legal possibilities there are. So that's all we can do and all we have to do. Um, with regard to the nine eyes, uh, probably you've heard uh, the Minister of the Interior saying, I can't tell you if we belong to the nine eyes. So yeah. I'll follow suit <laughs> and say, <laughs> maybe we are in the nine eyes, maybe we are not. But um, that's not, uh, not much for discussion. Uh, with regard to the NSA, um, what the problem is, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I had a kind of conference with um, uh, Keith Alexander, who was in the Netherlands. Uh, I was alone with one a member of my staff, and he had 10 or 12 people around him, and he was telling, we are not interested in the Netherlands. We don't have any information at all about the Netherlands. That was before we heard how many telephone taps um, there had been, although we, I have to confess, even if you're talking about such an amount, it's a very, very small amount of what's daily going on on the uh, telephone, so that's not... Uh, it's offensive, but um, is it really serious? We are not quite sure. Um, I'm not going to mention those who are absent anymore. Mr. Albrecht. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, my question first with regard to what you have said would be, did you have a look at the documents revealed by Edward Snowden? Because, uh, I mean, those are proofs not contested at the moment, so I, I would expect you to know the content, and at the end, um, uh, some of your answers are contradicting the content, so I'm a bit weird about it. Uh, then, uh, with regard uh, to my for, uh, first que questions, which I also posed to Mr. Eriksson, I would like to know how you deal as committee with the fact uh, that there are obvious infringements to the territory of your member state by cyber attacks uh, from the NSA or the GCHQ. Do, we, do you deal with that? Do you investigate on that? Um, those are very interesting questions for us to know if national parliaments work on that. And also the question, if you uh, know if there's any cooperation between national parliaments on the uh, scrutiny on the work of intelligence services in Europe, the cooperation, if you know about INTSEN and what they're doing and which legal base they are on, and um, also uh, I heard that there has been a high official in the National Prosecutor's Office in the Dutch uh, uh, paper saying that uh, we are so uh, tapping so much uh, we don't know how to use it. So uh, do you really think that uh, in widening data collection at the moment and also under these circumstances is the right thing for parliamentarians to carry? Thank you. To start with the last question, there is a strict um, division in the Netherlands system between uh, criminal investigations and security investigations. So um, I'm fully agree with you, there are far too many tapping in the criminal cases um, and maybe even in uh, security cases, but that's far, far less than in criminal cases. So that makes an enormous difference. Um, with regard to the Snowden case, of course, we've seen uh, the documents as far as they are published. The only problem with my discussion with um, General Alexander was by then we didn't know what was in the, Snow uh, in the Snowden cases. That's the problem. So he could say, I have nothing to do with the Netherlands, and I couldn't retort because I didn't know at that moment he had, it would have been easier if he had come a week later. Then we would have known more. Um, I think that's about all I can answer at this moment. If you, if you, want, to add a, if you want to add anything, use your microphone, and you have 10 seconds. 
So, no knowledge about INSEN, no knowledge about cooperation with, as a national parliament? Um, well, of course, then we, you have to wait for the report we are making. So, I, I can't tell what I, what's in this report. For first, we have to report to our own parliament. Thank you. Okay, then uh, I give myself the floor as shadow for the elder group before we get to the uh, other members. Um, I will uh, Meneer Van Delde aanspreken. Well, I'm going to speak my mother tongue, which makes a change. Now, first of all, you said that the subsidiarity, proportionality and, necess and uh, need test is carried out. Now, um, Netherlands really is one of the world champions of uh, uh, monitoring. So do you really think that these principles of subsid subsidiarity and proportionality really uh, take really are respected. Have we not seen in the last 10 years that the distinction between intelligence on the one hand and criminal cases on the other has rather become vague in the so-called uh, fight against terror? Secondly, I'd like to come back to the question that's been raised by Mr. Morais. Now, I read and was very surprised when I read in the paper that your uh, supervisory committee, your review committee, hasn't pronounced uh, about the purchase of uh, illegal spyware by the Dutch government, which uh, currently can't yet be used. Now, you have said that uh, you count on the security services to, you count on their mentality to have self-discipline and uh, own up to any mis misdeeds. And I don't really think that their behaviour currently is uh, bearing witness to any kind of self-discipline uh, and do, are you not concerned about that? Now, thirdly, do you think that supervision on the Dutch uh, intelligence services is working well in the Netherlands? Because uh, we get the impression that in every other country it's not working very well at all. Otherwise, we might have been able to prevent what Mr. Snowden has actually discovered. Even in the United States, people are admitting that supervision is not working. So why is it working so well in the Netherlands, according to you, and in other countries not working? Finally, all of this monitoring and mass surveillance, what actually is necessary and what is unnecessary? Isn't it true, as far as you're concerned, that we have a so-called chilling effect taking place, namely that uh, whistleblowers, journalists, uh, politicians as well, uh, if they are afraid that they might end up being the subject of mass surveillance, that they no longer exercise their democratic rights to free expression. So all of this unnecessary uh, listening in on people and monitoring, doesn't that really have a major uh, risk for the democratic uh, state as such? Well, as for unnecessary listening and disproportionate listening, well, that's a major uh, risk. But what I don't agree with you is that in the Netherlands, uh, uh, there isn't a strict distinction between uh, the uh, judicial world on the one hand and the intelligence world on, on the other. Now, that there's a great deal of listening going on uh, and too much listening going on, I, that's not the case, I think, in the Netherlands because we see every case of telephone tapping. We can uh, look into them in depth. We don't do that in every case, but we certainly have a system in place. And as soon as we discover that there's a case where people are going too far and listening in on people for too long or listening into the wrong people, then this is reported on. And uh, this telephone tapping is always stopped by the minister. And this uh, is always a very low number of cases, in fact. Now, as to the spyware which might have been purchased, uh, might or might not have been purchased, I think there's a difference between purchasing of apparatus and its being used. Now, um, this might have been a major mispurchase of several million euros wasted, that's maybe the case, but sometimes people uh, buy things, to, buy tools to have in their armory, and then if the law is changed, they might actually uh, take them out and use them. But if the law doesn't allow for the use of this kind of thing, well, then uh, we'll make sure that we keep very close supervision and uh, resist the use of uh, these tools uh, and publish our reports about any use. Now, um, of course, 
in the Netherlands. All we can do is see what's happening in uh, the Netherlands, and we can only keep tabs on the Netherlands security services, and that's true for every other country. Now, what the Americans are doing, or any other country, uh, round and about the Netherlands, or even in the Netherlands, we cannot see that. Now, when one of our services becomes aware of another country that is carrying out uh, activities in the Netherlands without informing the Netherlands services, well then we would take measures, whether that might be the American Secret Services, the Belgian, the Finnish Secret Services, whoever, it doesn't matter. There have been uh, cases of this in the past where um, we asked somebody to stop carrying out uh, activities because they were not in accordance with the rules. Americans would that also be the case if the American Secret Service or the British Intelligence Services had uh, gained access, access to the SWIFT server in the Netherlands without permission? Sí. Yes, indeed. If that had happened, well, yes, we would take measures uh, to stop it. And the problem is that many of these services can be found all over the place. Uh, and sometimes you might think a server is in the Netherlands and you actually find out that the server is in another country and then there's nothing we can do. Anything that actually is physically in the Netherlands, we can take measures on. But you need to prove that uh, a server has been broken into. Okay, I have two last requests for the floor. Mrs. Zippel, Mrs. Sargentini, anybody else? No, Mrs. Zippel. Thank you very much. I've got two relatively brief, simple questions. You mentioned regular reports on the intelligence services. And my question, does this scrutiny committee for the intelligence services meet regularly? Does it meet as regularly as uh, the reports come out or just on a whim of uh, its members? Secondly, we've often heard that not all content is monitored but only key words. Could I ask you on what basis are these key words defined in your country? Is it sufficient for one uh, key word to appear for my communications to be monitored, or do they, does there need to be more than one? Do these key words change? Uh, and do you have an idea of how many of these uh, key words are currently being searched for? First of all, there is. No, I shall in Nederland doorgaan. I'm going to continue in Dutch. Well, there is regular information exchange between the services. That happens more with some services than with others, but uh, we do have an obligation to make sure that that takes place and uh, standards of information exchange need to be strictly kept to. Now as to s the search terms that are used, well, we have lists of uh, words, and uh, we don't adopt these lists. We can pass comments on them. We get to see them anyway, and we might say, well, such a word is not a good idea or is worthless, and then they can be deleted. Now, we do, on a regular basis, every couple of months, we look at these lists of search words and keywords, um, and, uh, uh, because you need to make sure you're looking for worthwhile search terms. and so. Uh, we do scrutinize these things, and uh, we have said regularly in reports that uh, quite often uh, search terms are far too broad and vague, and more, so more, more focus needs to be placed on them. Thank you, Mr. Sargentini. Thank you, Mrs. Sargentini. Thank you. Mr. von Delder, I wanted to talk about the interview that you gave in the Dutch newspaper, the Volkskrant, this weekend. Uh, Mr. Morris was also referred to. And you said in that interview that the Dutch intelligence services want to uh, purchase new in, uh, tools for um, intelligence gathering, uh, which currently are not legal, but the law is out of date. Now, I've just heard you say that um, purchasing uh, things is not the same as using them. 
Well, uh, I'm sure that's true of the high-speed train, the FIRA, as well, between Belgium and the Netherlands, where uh, or the, or tr that's also the case with the new jet fighter plane, the, the GSF. I'm sure you just bought it not to use it. So it's quite a strange comment that you made. But why is it, perhaps you can tell us, that the Dutch legislation, as far as you're concerned, is out of date in this area? And why is it that... Uh, the uh, Dutch intelligence services uh, ought to purchase these new intelligence gathering tools waiting for a change in the law. Secondly, I heard you give an assessment of search words that are used. They might be too vague or too narrow, and I think you um, said that uh, certain search terms might be worthless. I remember at the start of this year there was a report that came out about left-wing extremism. Now, has your committee uh, voiced an assessment on that and as to whether that kind of investigation is worthwhile? What was your evaluation of that, in fact? Well, firstly, on the question of legislation, uh, which I think is out of date, in particular, that was whether um, you should be allowed to distinguish between information that's on the cable or not on cable. Now, at the moment in the Netherlands, you're only allowed to uh, carry out information gathering on informa data that's not travelling by cable. Cable, And nowadays, 90% of information is travelling by cable, and so we cannot gather information on it, which I think is a strange situation. I've always compared this with criminal justice about 40 years ago. Now, back then, the police were allowed to tap telephones, but they weren't allowed to look at the telex machine. Now, a lot of people said, well, I'm just going to go over to the telex machine, and then the police, uh, they weren't able to follow the investigation then. And then what we did was we changed the law to allow the police look at, to look at the telex. And uh, this is really the same sort of thing. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that we'll be able to change the law to allow intelligence services to no longer have to make a distinction between information travelling by cable or travelling through the air. Now, I don't exclude that uh, perhaps in a couple of years' time all data will be travelling by air again and not through the cable, so you need to be able to be flexible. Now, as for whether certain searches are a waste of time or worthless, well, I can have my own point of view on that, but uh, that's not really what my uh, committee is all about. We, all we do is look at uh, whether the law is being kept to. Uh, it's not up to us to make a judgment about the objective uh, of intelligence. Now... Um, we might say, OK, you've followed the rules of the law, but what on earth are you actually doing? You know, but that's not really our task. Thank you very much, Mr. van Delden. I think it's funny you mentioned telex. I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago in a conversation, and, and one of my trainees asked me what that was, telex. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, sometime in the future, someone will say, what's a smartphone? <laughs> I've never heard of a smartphone. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to the end of this session with only seven minutes uh, of delay. I'm going to, uh, without further ado, invite onto the podium uh, Mrs. Belts, Mr. Lundblad and Mr. Allen on behalf of respectively Microsoft, Google and Facebook for our last session.
Okay, colleagues, we continue with our third session. I welcome on the podium the representatives of Microsoft, Google, and Facebook. For your information, uh, Apple has met with the Libya delegation in Washington last week <coughs> and sent correspondence to the chair of the committee uh, on November 6th. Yahoo and Amazon ha have been invited as well. However, they both declined to take part in the hearing uh, and letters setting out their uh, or stating their reasons have been uh, published on the LIBE website, if I'm uh, informed correctly. Uh, I don't think I'm going to do a long introduction because everybody here knows uh, why we have invited representatives of, um, uh, of industry. I'm going to ask uh, our three guests, very welcome, um, to make a very short introductory statement of maximum 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to invite you in the following order, Mrs. Belts, Mr. Lundblad, and Mr. Allen. Mr. Belts, you have the floor. So, yes, thank you for inviting me to this uh, hearing today. Uh, we appreciate uh, the opportunity to be heard and to speak uh, in front of the esteemed House. And uh, we also think that de a debate is the best way on the topic uh, for the governments to advance, you know, the discussion how to strike the balance between national security and privacy in the digital age, as this is urgently needed. And we also support and strive for reform where it is necessary. In my in intervention, I would like to focus on three topics. Microsoft's practices in responding to data access requests from governments right now. Second, our practice in securing customer data and protecting our customer data against unwarranted access. And three, what can we do to ensure that EU citizens' data are safe anywhere in the world? So, before we talk about the, the practices, uh, how we respond to the data access requests by public authorities in the US and elsewhere, I wanted to give a little bit an overview of what role we as Microsoft, as a company, play through our um, um, services and products. So the volume and the complexity of information of the data that has been closed, I think, has been raised some, you know, confusion. So um, I think there is a common interest, and in you are striving for this, um, that we establish a good understanding uh, of the facts, which then will allow us to find uh, the right solutions. So Microsoft, I hope, is known to everybody, offering a wide range of services, software, and devices. So in Windows and Office, we today offer as on-premise solution, but also in the cloud, which means through a service offering. And we offer consumer-facing products like Outlook.com, Xbox, mobile technologies, search, other online tools, and most recently we have been moving into the devices um, business with Surface. And we acquired, last but not least, in November 2011, Skype, which is also in the middle of the debate. When offering our services to our customers, like Hotmail or Office 365, the data of our customers are hosted on our server farms. In that scenario, we handle government data access requests, and we take steps to protect our server infrastructure against any unwarranted access. Information exchange with customers is delivered through public service providers, so we don't own own networks. To protect customers' data, during on consumer data, during the transportation, we offer a set of different protection solutions which can include encryption. Most of our customers still today license and use our software on premise, so on their own servers or service providers. They or their service providers control the access to their data, and we help our customers to protect themselves against unwarranted access through constant security updates and cybercrime initiatives like takedown of botnets. So how do we handle data access requests? Microsoft only discloses customer data in response to valid legal orders, and this is applicable for all countries in the world where we do business. Except in most limited circumstances, U.S. law generally prohibits the voluntary disclosure of customer data to a governmental entity. Microsoft does not provide any government in the world with direct or unfettered access to our customer data. And we do not support or give any technical uh, details to any governments 
that they get, can get access to customer data not located on our servers. <coughs> So we do not build backdoors into our products and we do not provide any government with our encryption keys or help break them, help them break uh, encryption. What is the process when we receive a concrete request? First, we are today not, for rules of law, permitted to confirm which kind of request we receive from secret services and I hope you respect kind of that I'm keeping and obey here to the law, but what we can kind of explain in detail, and we are happy also to deliver more, is how do we in general handle any law enforcement or secret service requests? So what are our processes in the company? So if we receive a, we receive a request, we have a compliance team in the company which is reviewing the request and they ensure that the requests are valid and we reject those that are not, and make sure we only provide exactly the data specified in the order. Another important aspect, Microsoft only pulls and then provides the, data spe the specific data mandated by the relevant legal demand. So we do not give access to our server that somebody else can, you know, look around what he or she needs or what uh, the entity needs. We are doing the search and handing the data over. In June 2013, we were publishing information about the volume of law enforcement and national security orders served on Microsoft in an aggregate form. For the first time, we were permitted to include the total volume of national security orders, which may include FISA orders in this reporting. We are still not permitted to confirm whether we have received any FISA orders, but if we were to have received any, they would be included in our aggregate volumes. The data shows that for the six months ended in December 31st, 2012, Microsoft received between 6,000 and 7,000 criminal and national, national security warrants, subpoenas, and orders affecting between 31,000 and 32,000 consumer accounts from U.S. governmental entities. This includes local, state, and federal requests. This is all on our website, so you can look there at the details of the numbers. To give you some ideas of the context of law, uh, reform and law enforcement requests, we have rejected and will continue to reject and resist government demands if there is a legal basis for us to do so. So, for example, during the first half of 2013, we have rejected 911, so equals 2.4% of requests for not meeting legal requirements. And in nearly 20% of the requests, no data we, you know, we are looking for, we are found, so we couldn't, or we didn't hand anything over. We only respond to requests for specific accounts and identifiers. We don't offer unfettered access to the data. While we are obliged to comply, we keep also track on the received orders and build a track record to ensure that they are valid and disclose only the data covered by the order. We always require law enforcement and entities and national security agencies to follow the laws, rules, and procedures for requesting customer data in criminal investigations. And we have gone as far as we can be to be transparent about compliance our law enforcement request reports set exactly out how we handle these type of requests. The second topic, how do we ensure security of our customer data? Microsoft takes a number of steps to secure customer data. These include technical and physical measures, just to mention one uh, which is mentioned in the debate is encryption uh, as one solution, but we also offer for example, for Outlook.com, extended uh, validation sets uh, that uh, use a uh, uh, higher level of uh, encryption. As we also learn a lot of information through the press today, we need to say that we are reviewing our own security policies and measures in the products uh, to figure out um, if there are changes, technical changes to be made to improve the security of our um, customers and consumers. So my third topic is what should we do to ensure that U.S. citizens' data are safe anywhere in the world? As I mentioned at the beginning, I think we need to first understand the facts, which is in this case, as we heard also during the session today, not as easy to figure out. 
And it will be important to find solutions to ensure that citizens' fundamental rights, like privacy, are protected with the same level in the digital world. At the same time, governments will need to protect their country's security and safety of citizens and have meaningful, meaningful ways to fight cybercrime. How to draw the balance requires political decisions based on democratically legitimized processes. All governments today are requesting access to data. Viable solutions that mitigate the impact on user privacy needs to consider the global, have to consider the global nature of the Internet and thus be global. Last but not least, any solution will have to consider the profound impact uh, which it could have on the development of an open and free Internet. Microsoft welcomes the initiative of the European Parliament to explore solutions to the current situation. As a multinational company, we comply with applicable laws in multiple countries. We have been seeing an <coughs> increase in government interest in access to user data, as well as concerted effort by governments to protect against the disclosure of their citizens' data. Both of these developments have been inten intensifying. Juggling these competing demands has become complex and could have not only negative impact of the openness and the development of the Internet, but also to be to the detriment of the citizens. How to solve the situation? Our point of view is that we need more universally agreed rules and principles government, uh, go governing government access to customer data. To solve these problems, we think governments around the world should roll up their sleeves and forge new, new consensus-based rules of the road. These rules must ensure that all countries respect the privacy of all of, our, all of our users, no matter where they are from or where they are located, and they must account for the global nature of our product and services. We need to make sure that this debate is open and informed so that the public can understand the nature and the scope of government access to customer data. We have filed a law lawsuit in the U.S. seeking the court's permission to publish more detailed information about any national security orders we may receive. We have also been strongly encouraging the U.S. Congress to continue to pass a law allowing technology companies to disclose relevant information in an appropriate way. And I was pleased to hear this morning um, Congressman Sensenhauer, uh, who kind of, whom we are supporting um, in, this, in his uh, proposals. We recognize that whilst more transparency is needed, also the system needs, to, system needs to change. Trust in cloud services can only be fully and permanently restored when governments change how they try to access data. As mentioned, data encryption is part of the solution, but it also requires thoughtful policy measures. We believe that territoriality is an important rule of law principle. Countries have sought to solve conflicts of law via mechanisms such as multi-legal assistance agreements. But let also let's face it, some countries have started to find ways to circumvent these agreements. So our ask is that to work through the agreements and try to figure out how to better to co collaborate instead to continue to work on um, circumventions. We also are supporting the European privacy rules, and we think that we need comprehensive privacy legislation in the U.S. I think there are privacy principles we, we can base ourselves on, but we need to gather you know, further and advance them to come to a more, uh, more similar or coherent um, frame as we have today. The Council of Europe conventions like on cybercrime and 108 data protection 108 Data Protection Convention could be starting points to discuss this because there, I think we have international um, agreements which can be the basis. Let me come to the end. So we, can, we let me close, sorry. Uh, Microsoft remains committed to the respect of human rights, free expression, and individual privacy. Therefore, we are looking forward to continue this dialogue, and we are committed to further engage to restore trust and confidence in the Internet. Thank you. Thank you very much. I realize I forgot for the three speakers to mention your position. Mrs. Boats is Vice President, Legal and Corporate Affairs, Microsoft for EMEA, that's Europe, Middle East and Africa. The next speaker, Mr. Lundblad, 
uh, is Director of Public Policy and Government Relations for Google. And the final speaker, Mr. Allen, is Director EMEA uh, Public Policy for Facebook. So I'm inviting Mr. Lundblad next for 10 minutes max, please. Thank you. I would like to thank you for providing Google the opportunity to speak at this hearing today. My name is Niklas Lundblad. I'm a Director for Public Policy and Government Relations uh, for Google based in Stockholm. First, I want to take this opportunity to reiterate the public statements that the CEO and General Counsel of Google, Inc., have categorically and emphatically made with regard to accusations regarding U.S. government surveillance. The position is unequivocal. We have not given the U.S. government access to Google servers, not directly or via back door or a so-called drop box. Google refuses to participate in any program for national security or other reasons that requires it to provide the U.S. or any other government with access to its systems or to install their equipment on Google's networks. Top executives of Google Inc. have expressed their outrage at the lengths to which the government seems to have gone to intercept data from private fiber networks. These accusations have severely eroded user trust in the Internet, ultimately also in the information society, and they underscore the need for a serious and timely debate on reform. So we're very happy to be here today. Keeping user information safe and secure is our highest priority. <coughs> Google strives to go above and beyond when it comes to security and protect our users in a variety of ways. For example, if it looks like there is suspicious behavior on a user's account at login, Google will notify the user over email and via a clear warning at the top of the user's Gmail page. Google also offers two-step verification to all account holders, a technical mechanism that requires that the user generate a unique code to log in, in addition to username and password. Equipping users with tools and information to stay safe online is just one example of many security efforts. Google has also led the way when it comes to encryption for users, which is a necessary and effective defense against all types of threats to systems, both from government and non-government sources. Google has encrypted connections to Gmail by default since 2010 and has supported secure connections in Gmail since its 2004 launch. Encrypted web search has been available since 2011. Last month in the Washington Post, Eric Gross, Vice President of Security and Privacy Engineering at Google, publicly announced that Google has accelerated a plan to enable end-to-end -end encryption of data traveling between data centers. This is something the company decided to do already in 2012 and announced in January 2013. Yet, providing extensive encryption isn't enough. Internet security is an arms race. Every advance in user protection creates a new challenge for sophisticated attackers trying to penetrate systems. Google needs to continuously invest and innovate in order to stay ahead and keep users safe and secure, which means expanding efforts beyond Google's own products and services. To do this, Google has undertaken large efforts to help produce malware online, for example. In 2006, Google built a sophisticated system called Safe Browsing that detects and flags unsafe sites across the web. Google's Chrome browser and other companies' browsers that use this free Safe Browsing API including Firefox and Safari, display a warning to users when they are about to visit a site that may be unsafe. Malware is a known mechanism used by malicious actors, including governments, to surreptitiously monitor user behavior or collect information. Google detects up to 10,000 malware and phishing sites per day and helps protect about a billion users from these threats. In addition, Google has an ongoing partnership with Stop Badware, a group that offers resources for webmasters who want to keep their sites clean from malware. Finally, through an industry coalition called the Messaging Malware and Mobile Anti-Abuse Working Group, Google has been instrumental in a joint effort with companies around the world to fight abuse and malware online. I would now like to take a few minutes to explain how Google Inc. deals with requests for user data from any government. The Google Inc. legal team handles each request on a case-by-case -case basis, reviewing each request independently. The team pushes back on the scope of these requests if they are too broad, and they challenge requests that do not follow the correct process. I should be here before you today with charts explaining how many requests Google Inc. receives from U.S. national security agencies. Google Inc. brought an action in federal court in the United States seeking a declaration that it has the right to publish such statistics about national security legal process. But the declaration has not been granted. 
Ensuring that companies can report statistics like this would facilitate an informed debate on how to balance users' rights to be free from unlawful government intrusion with the needs of the law enforcement and intelligence communities for legitimate purposes. This is why I would like to close by discussing the issue of transparency and the legal framework that currently exists for government requests to access EU citizens' data. Google has been a long-term advocate for and a leader in providing transparency about government requests for user data. The Google Inc. Transparency Report, which you can find at google.com slash transparency report, shows a breakdown by country, um, by country of government requests for user data. Google Inc. was the first company to lo launch such a tool back in 2010. Following the revelations this summer, Google requested authorization to publish statistics about receipts or requests made under certain national security laws. We're disappointed that the Department of Justice opposed our petition for greater transparency around FISA requests for user information. Openness in the process is necessary since no one can fully see what the government has presented to the court. Transparency is only the first step. Agreements like the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties guarantee that standards for due process are met and offer a consistent framework for expedient mutual assistance in criminal investigations, for example. Where countries other than the country in which a company is headquartered require use of data and it's legally justified, an MLAT can provide the right framework for law enforcement cooperation. But more can and should be done to significantly improve this process. We have been thinking about what such a reform could look like for years and would be delighted to follow up with this committee on issue reform. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak at this hearing, and I welcome any further questions you may have on the issue. Thank you very much also for being concise. And the final speaker on this panel, Mr. Richard Allen, on behalf of Facebook. Thank you, Chair. And I'd like to follow uh, Nicholas's lead on timing and warn the translators that I will skip the first uh, three pages of the prepared statement we sent, so there's more time for questions, and start at the bottom of page three, uh, our data request policies and practices. The first bit just tells you how great we are, and I think you can read it on the website. So uh, turning straight to um, Facebook's policies and practices on data disclosure, uh, Facebook has also, and again this will be repetitive, uh, developed uh, well-established uh, practices uh, to help governmental authorities around the world submit data requests. Now, these processes are described in guidelines that we've published publicly on our website. Uh, law enforcement authorities in Europe and elsewhere around the world can submit requests for data in official investigations directly to Facebook through Facebook's law enforcement online request system at www.facebook.com slash records. Uh, they can do it by fax, uh, another technology that may go out of uh, common usage, or by post uh, to uh, Facebook Ireland. To ensure that these processes are well understood, Facebook representatives have provided guidance and training for police officers in Europe, particularly those who focus on the internet and child safety. Facebook has stringent processes in place to handle all government data requests. Facebook believes this process protects the data of the people who use Facebook and requires all governments to meet a high legal bar. Facebook scrutinizes each request for legal sufficiency under its terms and under the strict letter of the law, and requires a detailed description of the legal and factual basis for the requests. Facebook pushes back when it finds legal deficiencies and fights many of these requests, and is often successful in narrowing the scope of overly broad or vague requests. In many cases, Facebook is required to share only very limited data about an account, such as basic subscriber information. Facebook is able to respond expeditiously to many European requests, including requests where there's an imminent risk of death or bodily harm. For example, we've worked with law enforcement authorities in child abduction cases to assist in locating the missing child. The activities of Facebook Ireland's law enforcement response team have been examined by the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner of Ireland during his audit of Facebook Ireland and his follow-up report of 21st of September 2012. During the September 2012 review, the Data Protection Commissioner found that all of the requests they examined met the conditions in the Irish Data Protection Acts. They also stated their view that, and I quote, Facebook Ireland is appropriately assessing requests and either seeking additional information or justification where it has concerns or is refusing such requests, end quote. Turning now to the reports about government surveillance, it's certainly true that over the, the past several months, there's been a great deal of media coverage and, online, and interest in the nature and extent of government requests 
uh, from online providers in national security investigation and how companies like Facebook respond to these requests. Much of this coverage has been inaccurate or misleading. Facebook has therefore taken a number of concrete steps to address these concerns. First, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder and CEO of, of Facebook, has forcefully and repeatedly rejected false reports that Facebook has somehow allowed direct or unfettered access by any government to Facebook data. As he stated the day after these news reports first surfaced, and I quote, Facebook is not and has never been part of any program to give the US or any other government direct access to our servers. We have never received a blanket request or court order from any government agency asking for information or metadata in bulk, and if we did, we would fight it aggressively." End quote. Second, Facebook has released the maximum amount of information allowed by law concerning the date government data requests it has received. In June, about a week after these reports and after intense negotiations with the U.S. government, Facebook released a U.S. government request report that included all U.S. national security-related requests, something no, government, no company had been permitted to do before that time. These numbers showed the limited number of these data requests. For the six months ended December 31, 2012, the total number of user data requests that Facebook received from any and all government agencies in the U.S., including local, state, and federal, and including criminal and national security-related requests, was between 9 and 10,000. These requests run the gamut of matters from things like a local sheriff trying to find a missing child to a police department investigating an assault to a national security official investigating a terrorist threat. The total number of user accounts for which data was requested pursuant to the entirety of those 9 to 10,000 requests was between 18 and 19,000 user accounts. In August, we supplemented our disclosures of U.S. request data with a global government request report that provided information on the total number of requests for user data that Facebook had received from every country that submitted a data request in the first half of 2013. This report stated that the total number of U.S. requests of all types was between 11 and 12,000, requesting information on between 20 and 21,000 accounts. And note that this U.S. number includes any requests that have been made on behalf of third countries, including EU countries, through the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty Arrangements, which Nicholas referred to. Through this MLAT process, a request is made to the U.S. Department of Justice by the government of a country that is party to an MLAT arrangement and will be served on Facebook by a U.S. court in a similar way to a U.S. domestic request. And I agree with Nicholas that there's a lot we could do, I think, uh, to improve the MLAT process. In addition, the report detailed a specific number of requests from each European country. The total number of requests that came directly from EU countries for this period was 8,500, and these requests targeted approximately 10,000 user accounts. With more than 1.2 billion active users worldwide, these reports demonstrate that a tiny fraction of 1% of Facebook user accounts were subject to any kind of government request in the past year. We believe that this helps put in perspective the numbers involved and lays to rest some of the hyperbolic and misleading assertions that we've seen about the frequency and scope of the data requests that Facebook receives. Third, Facebook, along with others in the industry, has been pushing the United States government for the ability to be even more transparent about government requests. In September, Facebook filed a legal action with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in Washington, D.C., seeking authority to disclose, at regular reporting intervals, the total number of national security orders it has received, if any, the total number of user accounts specified in such orders, and the number of requests seeking the content of communications versus those seeking transactional subscriber information. While transparency is a crucial first step to an informed public debate, we believe that more needs to be done. In late October, Facebook joined several other providers, including those here, in publicly calling for government surveillance practices to be reformed, to include substantial enhancements to privacy protections, and appropriate oversight and accountability mechanisms for those programs. Together with the other companies, uh, we sent a letter that ap applauded uh, Representative Sensebrenner, uh, who we heard from today, and his colleagues for the important contribution to the debate that their legislative proposal represents. Uh, Facebook will continue to be vigilant in protecting our users' data from unwarranted government requests, and will continue to ask all governments to be as transparent as possible. 
We're very interested in the work of elected representatives around the world as they develop policy and legislation on access to internet data. We believe that we have a common goal in wanting there to be widespread public trust in the way in which governments create and use their powers in this sensitive area. In that spirit, we're happy to do what we can to help the European Parliament to bring its expertise to bear on these complex questions. I hope that this statement and my responses to any questions you have will help in that process. Thank you very much. Um, okay, having listened to these three um, introductions, we'll now open the floor for <coughs> questions and debate. Uh, I have the Rapporteur and two shadows and two more requests for the floor. Anybody else wants to come in? No? Then, yes, Ms. Ludford. Okay, so we have three other members, and then I close the list. Um, I propose that um, <laughs> either you put your question to one of the speakers specifically. Uh, if not, then um, I'll ask all three speakers to, to respond, and I'll, I'll apply the same order as your, um, your, your um, introductions. Mr. Moraz. Sophie, I think with, as with, we got so much information and I mean, we just saw Apple in Washington, so we now got the three big companies. I think this, the, it was information rich despite not reading your website. And I think what has happened here is that there's a kind of preemption. I mean, I think the, the key allegations that came from Snowden have, in a sense, been answered in, in your prepared statements. And I think, I think the first thing to do is to just restate what those key allegations were because clearly the, there is a, um, a, a denial which is inevitable but I just want to go through those denials again and, uh, and also ask some specific questions to the three. I don't think there's many people taking the floor so I'll just, just go through some of that just now. Could I just first of all ask a couple of specific questions to uh, Ms. Bells of Microsoft, and thank all of you for coming, by the way. Um, first of all, just to pick up on um, some of the technical things that you mentioned, so as not to lose them for the record. Did you say that, um, or can I ask you if Microsoft encrypts data between your data centres, um, and, and Google doesn't do that? Could I just ask you that? Are you, are you, did you say that? Are you aware of that? And, and if the... We'll take the answers out. And if you don't, is it, is it prudent to do that? Because I think Google does do it. And I just want, didn't, well, I wanted to pick up on that. I want to just return um, to, to your statement, because in your statement you, you move very quickly onto the rules of the road and you uh, embrace what um, Congressman Sensenbrenner has said. But prior to that, prior to looking to the future, I just want to return to the fact that um, the reports that we've had in the inquiry up till now indicate that about 98% of PRISM production was alleged to have been based on Yahoo, Google and Microsoft um, uh, reporting that NSA would have access to its chats and emails and Hotmail, Skype, um, partly because Microsoft had developed a surveillance capability to deal with the interception of, of um, uh, those chats and email. Um, I mean, what is your reaction to to those allegations, I mean, you know, you, you, you've simply, you know, swept those allegations away today. Um, what are the different, what is your um, reaction to the allegations that uh, procedures would use, for example, to grant the NSA direct access to your centres and that um, you could pull the data from those um, centres or you could push the data? Now, you've talked about warrants and subpoenas, but clearly the allegations um, talked about, you know, bulk data. So, you know, how, how can you close the gap between those allegations and what you've said today? Um, the question to um, Mr. Lundland, um, again, you're talking about user trust and reform, but I just wanted to ask you about the, the allegations in the Washington Post um, on the 30th of October. Again, um, the question about the, um, the access um, between servers and the allegations. Again, I just want to, to repeat those allegations because I think, um, for the record, we just want to hear, you know, what your reaction is to that. I mean, uh, you've given a denial in your statement, but I think we need to know. Um, and on Facebook, again, the, you're talking about Zuckerberg and 
a flat denial, but did he have security clearance to talk to the US government so that you know, those press reports were very clear that he did have the access? Um, and we need to know again you know, what your reaction is to that, um, rather than to go from this inquiry with us thinking that you are simply denying that there was any interaction between uh, Facebook and the NSA at all, um, which, we, which we obviously feel um, in the evidence we've taken in the inquiry up till now, um, you know, feels a little bit um, difficult to, uh, to believe. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask the panellists to, uh, to respond. Uh, please be very concise, maximum two minutes each, otherwise we don't make it until 6.30. This is both. Yes, so give me, let me give a try. Let me first, first start with the surveillance capability in prison. Um, we only can confirm what I already confirmed and what also the general counsel of Microsoft has been con co confirming. We don't know PRISM as a program we have not participating in, and we do not give unfettered access to our data center. So if you then ask how this can be you know, mapped to the allegations, um, I think that's why I made the remark one needs to look at the whole ecosystem because there are different ways how to get access to data also to Microsoft servers or, you know, through the infrastructure. So we are, have a common interest to figure out how this has happened. Second, um, direct, and this is kind of, you know, already uh, answering also the third question, direct access, as I also mentioned in my introductory statement, we do not give direct access to our server. We don't. We hand over the data. We pull them. Um, and this is what I only can confirm, you know, what I have said before. On encryption, look, Microsoft oft is offering uh, a number of services, a multitude of uh, numbers. I cannot map you out what we all do with all the different, um, um, uh, you know, how do we encrypt the different services. Generally, um, what I uh, can uh, say uh, today is that the, you know, for server to server, uh, transportation is generally not encrypted. This is why we are currently reviewing our security system and uh, to enhance, to avoid that um, uh, interception into the communication can take place. Thank you. Mr. Lundblad. Thank you. Yes, as pertains to the Washington Post allegations, I would say that uh, we are as all systems in the information society, constantly in different ways under attack, which means that we're constantly evolving our systems of response. As Eric Gross, as I, who I quoted in my intervention says, it's an arms race, and that's why we're currently encrypting all of those different connections and all of those different networks. It is, however, not you know, finished, or there's no point at which you can say you're done. It's an evolving work, and we will continue to find new ways and new security measures to ensure that we can, can secure our users' data. Okay, thank you, Mr. Allen. Um, so on, on the, um, the material that's been published, I mean, you know, we can read it and make educated guesses about what's going on. We, we I think, as people who work in Internet companies are not privy to any more information about the inner workings of a government agency than, than anyone else. But it does seem clear when you read the material that it's talking about systems that are inside that agency, i.e. what they do once they've obtained the data, um, which I say is not something that we have any awareness of. Uh, what we do have awareness of is when they make the request to us for the data. And on that, I think we have been clear and unequivocal um, that you know, we, we will publish as much information as we can about those requests. And we've been unequivocal in stating that those requests are targeted, uh, backed up by lawful authority. They don't involve bulk data collection and they don't involve direct access. You asked why our CEO made the statement. It was to be as definitive as we possibly could be. If, if anyone else had made the statement, uh, people would have said, but, you know, there, there's something else going on. By having the CEO make that statement, we are trying to be as clear as we can that as a company, uh, those are the only requests that we've seen uh, and that there is nothing else going on. Thank you. Next uh, speaker, Mr. Albrecht. Thank you very much also to be here. Um, I will have some questions and I would really like them to be answered, so perhaps you just note it down. But first of all, let me say that um, I'm very happy to have you here and I'm happy about especially the comments uh, by Ms. Belts on our privacy legislation 
to be put forward. I think uh, we are welcoming very much if uh, also the uh, IT business is now seeing the value in it and also the comprehensive legislation in the US, I think we are looking forward to it together and that there's uh, a protection for EU citizens and so, as well as for all other citizens uh, when it comes to our rules. But when I listen to all your remarks, um, then I hear, especially from Mr. Lundbert and from Mr. Allen, the wording unwarranted access. And I think it's important to say to everybody in the outside world that this means uh, that there could be other ways of access your data and it could have happened that all their data have been compromised. Uh, you only answer in a way which is legally saying that there's no unwarranted access. But what your answer didn't answer is my first question. Which jurisdiction do you mean by referring to unwarranted? Which is the jurisdiction which you are following when, for example, you are processing EU citizens' personal data. Can you 100% exclude that you are breaching EU or EU member states' rules when processing EU citizens' personal data? And how to deal with the fact that authorities attack your systems? Did you request authorities in EU member states to investigate on possible infringements to cybercrime rules, so to cybersecurity of your servers? Do you investigate on your own on these attacks, possible attacks? Those are questions which I think are very important to EU citizens and I would like to have very detailed questions, uh, answers to that and especially the first question with regard to the jurisdiction, of course, also what is about the cloud? Are there different ways how to judge about the jurisdiction? I, th I think those are very important questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. The three panelists, please. Ms. Belt. Yes, uh, Mr. Albrecht, spot on, on which restriction to apply. And that's if I have a wish, would be good if you could get uh, some conflict of interest out of our way because, in fact, this is in the new world not anymore as clear. Um, and therefore, we try our best to be compliant to all the laws. As long as they are compliant, it's fine. Once they are conflicting, then we are in trouble to make it uh, very, you know, uh, bluntly. This re in related to now uh, very concrete how we apply the rules. If the data are on the server in the U.S., we certainly follow the U.S. rule diligently as we have been um, answering to that. Um, and if the data are on, uh, you know, in, in Ireland, we are following uh, those um, uh, rules. So uh, until today, luckily, I would say we haven't had any um, difficulties in following and applying to the rules, but going forward and also referring to your EU uh, privacy regulation, this famous Article 43 um, would bring us exactly into a conflict which we cannot solve. So my request would be to continue the conversation on that uh, uh, you know, intended uh, rule uh, because it will not solve the topic. It will just bring us into a conflict which we then cannot uh, follow up on. Um, second, um, you know, with regard to attacks on our servers, it's very simple. Uh, whoever is driving an attack against our server uh, is, a, you know, is trying to harm and, uh, and, and infringe our protection. So we have been able to build out quite sophisticated uh, cybercrime mechanisms and uh, activities because it's, you know, believe it or not more, the real criminals, the organized crime who tries to get access to our server than anybody else. Uh, and, you know, there we are constantly looking into it and working it and we have, you know, built out a, a huge system where we are um, working on it and also, you know, collaborating uh, through certs um, to work with, um, you know, also government institutions to help fight cybercrime. Thank you, Mr. Lundblad. 
Thank you. In terms of jurisdiction, I think Dorothy hit the nail on. It's a conflict of laws that we would like to come out of. We would like to have clarity because in a very large extent, this is a government-to-government issue, and these rules need to be clarified at that very level. For many purposes, if you're headquartered in the U.S., then U.S. law applies, but there are many different shades and nuances to that argument, which means that you actually would welcome, if you're in Google's position, the kind of clarity that you're seeking. I also think that that, um, that that is where you have to start. Uh, you asked a specific question about cloud as well, and I think that once you start clarifying the government-to-government -government agreements on this issue, much else will follow from that clarification. On the second point, I would uh, also echo Dorothy. We have several teams that investigate possible attacks on our systems. We do that because we need to strengthen those systems. We need to make sure that they can become more resilient and more responsive to other types of attack. Um, knowing whether or not they are from certain attackers is a very tricky business. We concentrate on trying to protect the users by finding new patterns of attack and protecting against those and trying to become smarter in this ever ongoing arms race against people who try to penetrate the systems. Mr. Allen? And, I mean, I'd echo the comments from colleagues and, and, and just sort of reflect on one aspect of the jurisdictional debate. Again, we have multiple responsibilities. We have responsibilities in the United States where the uh, infrastructure is. We have responsibilities uh, in Ireland because Facebook Ireland is the data controller for users outside the United States and Canada. And we may have responsibilities directly in the country that is issuing the request for data uh, where they can be quite demanding and, and be quite assertive about their own jurisdiction. And we spend a lot of time trying to juggle all those responsibilities and not break anyone's law. Um, so to the extent that they, those can be harmonized, uh, that would be great. And just in, in, in framing that, which I know you're doing as policymakers, one thing that we would caution around is not letting the uh, edge case, the extreme case, condition too much the general case, by which I mean, you know, we're obviously dealing with a very extreme debate in terms of uh, uh, people talking about mass data requests, national security requests. The typical request we get is, is straightforward crime. And there, you know, investigators in France are trying to catch somebody in Germany who's done something uh, criminal to that individual in France or between the Netherlands and Sweden, whatever it is. Those kind of cases, the investigators, again, do want that system to be reasonably friction-free. So whatever we end up with, you know, we want a system where those, those regular criminal investigations that may be cross-border these days in the age of the Internet can proceed whilst having appropriate checks and balances that, that deal with the kind of excesses I, I think you and your colleagues are concerned about. Okay, thank you. Um, then um, I will speak on behalf of the... Uh, so, Sophie, can, can I perhaps just catch up with one small thing? Because okay. you didn't answer uh, if you asked one EU member state uh, law enforcement authority with regard to the possibility of an infringement of your service by cyber attacks, uh, which, is, which is an obvious allegation. Perhaps one of you just, I mean, I would be interested in how that works. Okay, Mr. Allen? Yeah. I mean, we have done. So, so I, I have been involved myself in a hacking case where we identified that the individual who's trying to break into our systems was based in the United Kingdom. We absolutely reported it to UK law enforcement and worked with them to prosecute the individual. That's how we would react. Yeah. Okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll speak as shadow of the elder group uh, before coming to the other members. Uh, I have to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that you came here, but let's face it, these are all carefully prepared legal statements. And I think Jan Albrecht made it very clear that, you know, it reminds me very much, and I've made the joke before, of the statement uh, by President Clinton on the Levinsky case, when he said, I didn't have sexual intercourse with that woman, which was legally Relations. correct. Relations. Relations. Oh, they, see, I shouldn't be a lawyer. Sec <laughs> that was relations, not intercourse, for the intercourse. record. Oh, okay, well, sexual relations, which was legally correct, but it had no, no bearing on, on the truth. Um, you know, and, and, and we're, we're not lawyers. We want to hear the truth. This is about accountability to uh, European citizens. And, you know, even, even if you would want to tell the truth, and I have to say that, um, um, you know, and I don't hold this against you personally, but the businesses that you represent, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really moved by your, um, you know, strong desire to come clean and, and your fight for transparency, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's kind of late. 
uh, because I've been talking to representatives of your firms for many, many years, and off record, I've heard things, you know, that I found particularly shocking, but nobody ever wanted to go on record. So if I listen to your statements here today, it's like listening to civil liberties associations, but we're talking about companies who've been cooperating with governments under pressure. Yes, I recognize that, under pressure, but nevertheless. Um, you know, and there is a conflict of jurisdiction, and sometimes it's, it's difficult to solve, but I can understand that if, uh, who was it? Was it the CEO of Yahoo who said, you know, if I say what I want to say, I may end up in prison for 35 years. Um, but if you comply with U.S. law, at the same time, you violate EU law. And if I were a company, I'd also rather pick a fight with the European Commission than with the U.S. administration. You know, it's, it's, very, it's very evident, but in the end, we have to, to fight for the interest of our citizens, your users, and you mentioned the word trust. Well, can you blame the users for not trusting companies anymore? You know, okay, a few, a few questions. Um, encryption, yeah, great, encryption. But in one of our previous sessions, we've heard that even the companies which are, let's say, certifying encryption standards may have been corrupted by the, the, the US government. So how much value can we attach to encryption standards? I don't know. You can tell me that my data have been encrypted. I don't know what that means. You say that you don't allow for any back doors. Well, I don't know because the US government seems to be able to, to create you know, back doors and maybe there are back doors and you're not allowed to tell me under US law. I don't know. So how much trust can we attach to that? Then um, another element here is uh, we hear stories in the media about payment, not just covering the costs for compliance, but actual payment. Have your companies, can you say on record here that your companies have not received a penny beyond um, you know, the actual costs for compliance. And then it, would your companies be willing to provide this committee with an overview of um, government business orders that you have received? Because, of course, there is also another interest, you know, beyond direct payments, um, and, and, and that you might resume uh, under the, the motto, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And I can think of at least one company sitting on this podium which has extensive... Uh, uh, you know, business orders in the, in the defense sector. Uh, and there is nothing shameful about that, but I think it would be useful to, to make it very transparent, now that we all want transparency, where the business interests lie. And then one final question. Um, how do you feel about safe harbor? Do you have the feeling that that provides any kind of security to your users in this respect? Okay, those were my questions. I'm going to ask the panelists to respond in the usual order. Mrs. Belt. Yes, so I try to be short. Um, look, whilst I understand your frustration, um, I don't think that you can ex you know, expect from companies to make statements, infringing laws, and bringing the CEO into jail. Um, but and but sorry, is, sorry to yes. interrupt you. Sometimes, in re you know, you may be compelled to keep quiet by U.S. law, but we are in Europe. In Europe, you're supposed to report this kind of infringement. So it may well be that in complying with U.S. May, law, you're may, actually breaking yeah. EU law. May, maybe you let me kind of uh, finish on, on the topic because I think then kind of you can have um, uh, clarity. So, look, as we have been mentioning, we are all in favor of giving more transparency because that, I think, would allow a much better and much, uh, you know, on facts-based conversation. The difficulty we have is that we are no, not, not allowed to talk because this is not allowed by, by uh, U.S. law. And by the way, there are a number of laws here in Europe who do exactly the same, so, and we follow the rules, and we are supposed to follow the rules, and I don't think that you should blame me or someone that we are not following the rules. The second question you have been asking is, by that what we are doing, but what we are not telling, are we infringing, infringing Euro, European rules? And this is another a completely different question. And there I can tell you I am not aware of that we have been infringing any rules as of today. So now you see exactly the difficulty we are in because there are allegations. And, you know, we have difficulties to handle these allegations. But if, if my ask is don't make quick conclusions about what really is happening 
um, or not, and this has nothing to do with be on the scene or behind the scene. Let me go to the backdoors and the payment. So as I mentioned, we do not have backdoors, and as you can imagine, we are offering our products to the defense industry, we are offering our products to um, you know, governments with sensitive um, you know, data handling. We are aware, very well aware that our customers are very concerned exactly about the backdoor. So therefore, we have since a number of years a program which is called GSP, which allows governments to have a very detailed look into our technology, including the, um, or the source code and all these kind of elements to give them comfort that kind of they can see if there is a backdoor or not. This has been for us a very good kind of mechanism to give the insurance, but also there please understand that we do not and we cannot make public our business uh, a secrets and that we need to do this in closer, uh, uh, you know, in closer groups and with, a government, with an agreement which protects also our business interest. Payments. And this is also nothing which is different, you know, in the U.S. than in many other um, countries. If there is a search, this requires sometimes a lot of, and I'm talking now, independent law enforcement and uh, if there were um, secret service requests, you need to pull the data together. This requires quite a lot of, um, you know, this cost. So we are getting the costs, not more and not less. And I think this is only, you know, even beneficial to the whole system because the more uh, authorities need to pay, the more they think about if they really would like to collect the data. And if you think that we are as a company around the world, you know, we're getting many, many requests. I think, it, again, it's, it's not nothing, you know, there should be no conclusion that because we are getting our costs paid that we are doing uh, something uh, wrong. And on safe harbor, look, we are adhering to safe harbor, we are applying to safe harbor. Um, can safe harbor be improved? Yes, certainly we can discuss. Maybe one uh, aspect, you know, we, I would like to add, we are adhering to safe harbor on the consumer side because this is the vehicle today to uh, get the data transferred um, between the U.S. and uh, Europe, on the, uh, on the business side for our business customers, we are implementing the model clauses. So we are fully compliant with the privacy rules here in Europe, and we have even the confirmation from the privacy authorities that we are doing it. So I think there is not so much more, you know, we can give as evidence, um, and, you know, one should also respect kind of that then the limits might not be something, you know, wrongdoing, but it is just a limitation we are, uh, you know, obliged to follow. Thank you. We actually have a long history of doing things before now. Back in 2006, we were one of the first companies to push back at the Department of Justice when they made their first overbroad request for search queries. In a case that, that got a lot of attention in the U.S., but perhaps not, not uh, on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, we pushed back then, and we have continued to push back ever since because we do believe that it's important that government requests are limited, that they're purposefully designed, that they're actually that they're, um, fit for the purpose for which they're made. We started publishing our transparency report in 2010, way before any of this happened, because we felt that it was an important move for us as a company to make sure that citizens could make informed decisions about the means and measures taken to secure the open society by governments, and so that citizens could discuss those means and see if they were, were relevant and, and proportional to, to the purposes envisioned. Um, in terms of, of trust, I think that there is a dual trust question here. Of course, the Internet and the information society at large is losing trust. But I think a lot of citizens also are looking at their governments and asking if they can trust them, given that they don't necessarily have the transparency into what has been happening that they should have had, that they, that they should have had which is why we're pushing for reform in the U.S., and we would love to see reform in other countries and in the European Union as well, as goes to government transparency reporting, a simple basic step of disclosing how many requests are made on what basis, in aggregate numbers or any other numbers that are compliant with national security in order to make sure that citizen can, citizens can make informed decisions. Uh, we're here today to cooperate and to participate in this debate, and we're going to continue doing that because we believe it's important. This is not for show. This is important for us. And I think that, that in terms of, of backdoors and the question of remuneration, I would just echo what Dorothy said. There are no backdoors, and we have not received any remuneration for, for surveillance measures. Um, safe harbor can certainly be reformed. It can certainly be improved. It can certainly um, be, be tailored to the needs that we now see. There's a national security carve-out in there that one would need to examine more closely, for example. 
And uh, I think that, that uh, the important thing with that question is that it puts it squarely back where we believe it needs to start between governments in order to negotiate what those agreements should look like and what that framework looks like within which national security is protected. Thank you. Can I, I re repeat the other question asked? You, you think encryption standards are reliable? I think the open encryption standards that are now under scrutiny um, are as reliable as they can be, but they also need to evolve. As I said earlier, encryption standards don't stay reliable forever. So we should always update them. We should always improve them. We should always seek new encryption standards in order to improve security. Mr. Allen? Yeah, um, on, on the encryption side, um, Essentially, with security, what you're doing is trying to raise the cost of breaching the security. And encryption certainly does raise that cost. So even with compromises, I mean, the, the reaction to a compromise or threat of compromise is to go for a uh, stronger encryption system, which typically carries more cost, but also raises the cost for the person trying to break it. And I think Nicholas talked about an arms race earlier. That's exactly what companies like ours are in. And I know we're all looking at new technologies with long terminology that I won't go to here that, that actually helps us to, to get to the next stage. And I think that'll always be the case. On, um, on the debate more generally, I actually think we're on the same side. I mean, there's nobody who works for our companies who's not fundamentally a believer in the values of, of the connectivity we bring and freedom of expression and an open internet. And we worry about the chilling effect, I think, you know, in the similar way to the way that you do. I mean, the, these disclosures, these revelations day after day in the newspaper about our industry are really painful for us, and, and they're something we do want to challenge quite uh, strongly because they, they damage us, they damage the people who use our services, and our users are your citizens, your citizens are our users. They're indistinguishable in, in the case of services like ours. Um, their interests are indistinguishable, and I would hope that we would be working, you know, collectively to try and advance those interests. Um, in the, in, just to turn to a couple of specifics, on, on payments, at uh, Facebook we don't take payment for the government data requests that we receive. Interestingly, some activists have urged us to do so, privacy activists, and their, their logic is that if you charge governments, then they'll make fewer requests. Um, which is quite a compelling logic, and we've been kicking that around, but we, we you know, so far have adopted a policy position that says we won't take payment. But again, we'd be very interested in, in an open debate with policymakers about whether or not it's, it's worth adding the friction of money in there as some way of rationing the data requests that governments make. A very interesting public policy question. Uh, uh, finally, on the, on the safe harbour question, as, as an EU citizen, I would much rather do business with a company that's in the safe harbour them do business with one that's not. Because that tells me it's a very strong indicator that, that company is serious and is thoughtful about data protection. The FTC, as a company that is subject to an FTC order, the FTC is a tough regulatory body, the US Federal Trade Commission. They do regulate us effectively. Um, the national security piece is exempt at the moment, but interestingly, the safe harbor is intended to be two-way, and similarly, national security is exempted in the EU data protection regulation. So, so you know, I, it's logical that safe harbor doesn't today include national security because it's including the data protection directive bits, which don't include national security today in the EU side. Um, in future, sh should, you know, the EU-US arrangements be rewritten so they do include national security provisions, well, that appears to be on the table. Uh, from our point of view, probably a very uh, sensible step forward. But um, we understand why Safe Harbor today doesn't do that, because it's mirroring EU provisions which don't do that. Thanks. The question is, of course, always national security of which national state, exactly, but never mind. Okay, I'm going to, get to take the last uh, the questions of the, the last three um, uh, members present here um, and, and group them and then ask the panelists to respond to all the questions and then we can end um, by 6.30. So um, I'm calling in order Mr. Engström, Mr. Torvalds and Mrs. Lutford. Mr. Engström. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question for, for Mrs. Belt from Microsoft. Uh, you mentioned, well, you said several times that you don't have backdoors in, in your products, and of course uh, I'm very, very happy that you say that. Uh, the problem is, of course, that uh, mo mo most of your products are, are closed source, which means there is no way for an outside independent person to, to verify what is actually running on, on his or her computer once it's installed. You say that... Uh, you, uh, you allow some governments, etc., to, to read source code. And, and, of course, the source code that you let them read 
quite obviously that there are no backdoors in that source code. But there is no way to, I mean, because it's closed source, there's no way to verify that the code that you showed to somebody is actually what's running. In contrast, I mean, if we're talking about open source software, uh, operating systems like Linux, et cetera, uh, then, then the source code is published. Anybody with, it, with, a, uh, with, it, with the expertise can, can compile it, can compare the binaries. So we can, it's possible to verify open source software, but it's not possible to, to verify any of your products, I'm afraid. So my question is, if, speaking purely hypothetically, uh, if it were the case that the NSA or some other U.S. Uh, agency had ordered you to install backdoors in some or all of your products, would you be allowed to tell us that here now? <laughs> That's a funny one. Mr. Torvalds. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, first of all, going back to intercourse, as you, probably, as you probably know, there is a small town in Massachusetts with this interesting name. And I'm suspecting that all the three of you have business there with some organization. Uh, and that goes to the different way of asking. My colleague actually almost posed the question when my oldest son was asked the same question, Do, are there... Has he been approached by the NSA uh, about backdoors? Then he said no, but at the same time he nodded because then he was sort of in the legal free. He had given the right answer and everybody understood that NSA had approached them. And then we have the third question, uh, the third problem. Uh, Mrs. Belt said that there are no backdoors which is not technically actually true, because you have, you have bad programming with backdoors, because if you have, if you have bugs, and, and you have bugs in your program, and that bug is a backdoor, and you actually give, give away some money to a certain James Forshaw for finding one backdoor, and uh, we suspect that there are probably hundreds of bug backdoors in Windows programs. Thank you. Thank you. Last question for Mrs. Lutford. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, yes, I mean, rather similar to the line that you um, were, were pursuing. I mean, we are, of course, dependent on press reports for uh, the allegations of uh, bulk metadata collection through PRISM and Tempora and so on, compared to your presentations here today. And it's really very difficult for us to match up the two. I, uh, I heard Richard Allen say that you know, there is much that is um, um, untrue. I can't remember exactly actually have you used uh, and that may well be the case but of course it's impossible for for us to, to ascertain that but I am slightly intrigued by the wording at least two of you used uh, the phrase that they were, you permitted no direct or unfettered access to servers two of you at least used that what is the opposite is indirect and fettered access so could anyone tell me what you do allow if you don't allow direct and unfettered access to your servers? That's intercourse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think those were three very uh, precise questions. Uh, Mrs. Belt. Yeah, so now I feel as I was in an intelligence test, so let me give it a, a try. So um, it's all about trust. That's clear. But I think it's also what we need to take care of is that we ground ourselves on facts and on legal requirements. So open source versus uh, proprietary software, a long and heated debate uh, since many years. Look, open source, yes, has the beauty to be open, but it also is open, by the way, to those people who want to develop this uh, software 
to create some vulnerabilities and use the software to do exactly what you want uh, to avoid. It's not more secure. I would even say there is more higher risk um, with open source that you have, you know, that unwarranted access is taking place than for uh, what I call controlled software. First, second, if I am able to allow, uh, I would NSA allow me to answer this question? Look, it's very simple. I can answer the question. There is no backdoor. Full stop. So you know, I don't need to ask NSA to be able the, to. My question was hypothetically, if there was one. Would you be allowed to tell? If there was one, then I assume that I'm not allowed to be told because it's part of the secret, uh, you know, of the, of the rules which I have to apply not to talk. But I tell you that there is no backdoor. So then it comes to the next interesting question, what is a backdoor? And I think that's, you know, requires really, you know, uh, some, some investigation and to make a, clar a clarification. For me, a backdoor is that something is built in our software, a hole, a vulnerability, which we give to the NSA that they can use it to get access to data of whomever. So this is not what we are doing. Yes, our software has vulnerabilities, as, by the way, any other software in the world. So our approach is to protect our customers and to close as much as possible those vulnerabilities because, yes, indeed, there are many criminals out uh, Sorry, who would try or try to use it and uh, to do harm to our customers. So it is in the heart, in the DNA, in the core of Microsoft's business to continuously uh, close any vulnerability we have, and we certainly do not hand over any vulnerabilities for other purposes. And by the way, this is a very interesting conversation. If, you know, some governments around the world would uh, consequently use vulnerabilities of a technology in order to get access to data. Is this something which, from a political perspective, I cannot answer this from a political expert, you want to have this? And isn't this something you want to discuss on an intergovernmental level, if this should be allowed or not? But we are not providing, to make this very crystal clear, we are not providing any of these technical vulnerabilities to uh, give uh, you know, access uh, uh, to, uh, to allow others to get access to customer data or data of any, anybody um, using our technology. So the indirect and uh, the direct and fettered access, so let me answer this. So it's very simple. What we want to, and I think we all kind of have their very clear point of view, we only give access to our, to not access to data of our customers which are on, a ser on our servers if there is a concrete request, the request is legal, and then we do a search of the data. If the data are there, we are collecting them and we're handing them over. That is what Anymore? Sorry. I'm speaking too long. I'm sorry. Um, so the, you know, that is exactly what we are doing, and this is what we are obliged to do by law, and we follow, and we are here, adhere to laws, not only to the US law, but around the world, and we are getting from everywhere these requests. So indirect and unfettered would be that we say, look, here is our server, dear secret service, go, um, here is the interface, have fun, and check what you want to see. That is what we are not doing, and we can certainly exclude. Um, and um, you know, we all, you know, all companies here have been confirming this. You know, the unfortunate situation is that there are allegations out, and we have, you know, very complicated situation which doesn't allow us to defend. But look, I only know the word in German. Um, you know how you say for this. Im Zweifel für den Angeklagten. So as long as there is not really very concrete evidence. With the facts that we are doing this, you know, my ask is, hey, let's have a conversation how to overcome the trust situation instead of kind of going into a part situation which does not help you to solve the political problem, which is a political problem, and does not help us because it's a trust problem which also harms our business. So Lundblad. Yes, there's no direct, indirect, fettered or unfettered access. There's only legal government requests that are looked at and scrutinized on a case-by-case -case basis. I think um, that, is, that is the answer. It means there's no back doors and, and we can say so openly. I think, though, that, that the question is really valuable because it highlights something that's very important. When we say that, 
uh, you challenge that, there's no way for us to have an arbiter look at what actually has happened. And I think that whilst we know that we are telling you the truth, that's why we're driving for transparency, for parliamentary oversight, and for security that is only based on judicial authorization. That's the only way uh, that you're going to get to a position or a point at which you're going to be able to say with absolute certainty that we are, in fact, telling you the truth when we are. In your opinion, do programs like PRISM and Tempora not exist? We had not heard of any program called PRISM before the news broke. But of the general description that you've read about in the press, I mean, you know, does a program like that ring any bells with you, of that broad general description? We have description? not participated in any such program. We have not provided any access to But are you aware any in any yeah. sense that that kind of program, or is there no bulk metadata or whatever it is called? I mean, it's above my tech pay grade, quite frankly. But I am obviously does the wrong this person kind of thing okay, not okay. exist? The question no. is clear. Yes. The question is clear. I think I'm the wrong person to answer that question. It should be addressed to the security agencies around the world. Okay, Mr. Allen. I'm still, I'm just busy doing a status update, so I'm in the same room as Linus Torvalds' dad. I'm really excited. Um, the, uh, on the, um, you know, the question of how we sort of got here, I think people basically put two and two together and, and made 25 out of it. And, and there was an unfortunate, actually, coincidence in the news reporting that there was a report about bulk access to Verizon metadata, I think it was in the United States, that came out just before the revelations from uh, Edward Snowden, and all of that was jumbled up together. Uh, so the, we, have, we are spending time unpicking that. The, the language that was used, the direct and, fettered, uh, uh, direct and unfettered, was a reaction by our executives to press reports that used that language. So we didn't choose that language randomly. It was the press was saying, oh, my God, there's direct and unfettered access. So we had to say there is not direct and unfettered access to respond to that. Um, I mean, what's interesting, I think what's missing from the puzzle at the moment is it's remarkable to me how little information governments publish on their own requests. I mean, they are doing this in our name, all of us, uh, on our behalf, using lawful authority. It would seem to me that while we as companies, some of us slower than others, um, you know, have got to a point where we're willing to spend time and money publishing data about how many requests we receive, the people who send those requests, who are public servants paid for by us acting in our name, don't seem to think that they need to publish that information. And really, for any citizen to have a complete picture and know who's telling the truth, they need for us to say what we're receiving, which we've done very clearly today, but also the people who make the requests to say how many requests they've made in our name. And I think we can make progress in that. Then we can get past this bit of, you know, a lot of uh, putting little pieces together and making something uh, that may not be accurate. Okay. Thank you all very much. That brings us to the end of uh, today's session. Uh, thanks to uh, all the panelists for being here and uh, being exposed uh, indeed to our frustration. But it's our, it's our job to, to try and get at the truth somehow. Uh, thanks to everybody present. Thanks to the interpreters. Um, the next session of the inquiry committee will be on Thursday, the 14th. So that's in three days. Uh, in the afternoon from 3 to 6.30. Hope to see you there. <laughs>